Did it work? <laughs> I'm forgetting which buttons to press. Uh, no, yeah, we're having a weird little... But we're on time, so hey, that's a thing. Hello, hello Yeshua Network. Welcome to the... Welcome. Go ahead. Entire. Hello. Uh, entire Bible read through. Chapter 27 of Matthew. Yeah, yeah, part two. Yep. Okay, so we're going to jump right into it. Uh, we know that there is a lot to go over. I was pressing F5 like a maniac. Oh, is that refresh? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, we're we're really very, very happy to be on time tonight. Uh, thank you guys for your patience last week. All right. So kicking it off, we are on Matthew 27. We just got done covering the part about this guy named Judas. He was one of the 12 apostles. <laughs> like nobody knows that story. <laughs> like even non-believers know about him. This guy. This guy named Judas. He betrayed Yeshua, you know, on the last day. It was really sad. So we talked about that all last video, and now we're going to continue on uh, from there. That was, the that was the most, like, un... Informational. Un-pro yeah. recap Thank you. we've ever done. No, I'm sure I've done way more unpro. We may have. I'm pretty unprofessional sometimes. Well, me too, so... You're in good company. This is it. You're in bad company. This isn't about our polish and delivery. It's no. about the word of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> Thank God for that. And that sounds like satire, but it's not. <laughs> that part we're actually serious. <laughs> I'm just gonna shut up. Here we go. Ricardo is kicking us off. Matthew 27:11. If you guys don't know, I'll just recap for you as well. Do we have a graphic that we post on Facebook, Yeshua official page? And when you we, we post the chapter we're reading, you read it at home, and then you can leave your comments on that graphic. So what you're going to hear us reading when we say somebody's name and then we, we read about the chapter, it's not our content necessarily. It's stuff that folks like you, subscribers like you wrote, and it's a total fellowship. It's a participation from you. So if you're tuning in for this for the first time, I don't want you to think that you're about to hear two guys talk about the Bible. You're going to hear actually around 100 people talk about the Bible. It's pretty cool. So welcome. And uh, now we can kick it off. How'd I do? Was that, that more was professional great. and better? That was okay. Take two, totally got it. Almost I'm redeemed. Take two. Almost redeemed myself. Okay. Redeemed. Redeemed, yeah. That's a word. It's not. No. I make up words all the time. Yes. You, no. We're going back to amateur hour here. Well. I gave a window that was very small where we could have it's segued into a nice reading, but you did not really hard seek to that hang window. in the pro window. It's difficult. For us. Yes. Okay. Take three. <laughs> and here we go. Ricardo, Matthew 27, 11. Another fascinating example. When one of the apostles who wrote about this situation with extra details, which opens up the picture a little more and explains, as I read it, he says, uh, why probably Pilate was marveled on Yeshua not answering any accusations from chief priests and tried to help Yeshua. Matthew wrote, and Yeshua stood before the governor and the governor asked him, saying, art thou the king of the Jews? And Yeshua said unto him, thou sayest. Mark wrote, excuse me. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest. Luke wrote, And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest. But John wrote a more dynamic conversation, which makes me think why Pilate tried to actually not want to crucify Yeshua. The, then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Yeshua and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Yeshua answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Yeshua answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews? But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate answered, uh, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou king then? Yeshua answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end I was born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said, saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and say, saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Pretty interesting that John is the one who gives all that too. 
Uh, he continues on, Ricardo continues on and says, but as Matthew records it, when it came to the chief priest's accusation, Yeshua stood and said nothing. As I said, seeing this whole picture makes me not to see Pilate as the evil dude, but more as a leader with not much authority to confront masses of people who could do anything but what he did, washed his hands. Yeah. And then uh, Dina replies to you, uh, to your comment, and says, yes, uh, the fact that his wife suffering many things in a dream leads me to believe that they both knew that he, Yeshua, was no ordinary man. I often wonder what she saw in her dream and why we were never told. I wondered the same thing, Dina. I've always wondered why her dream was not written in or why it wasn't. She didn't explain it, at least mm -hmm. in the story. I've always thought that exact same thing. So very it, good comment, by the way, Ricardo. Thanks. It makes me think that, you know, because she had the dream. Yeah. There was like almost like a, you know, how Pharaoh was given mm -hmm. the dream. Don't mess with Abraham's wife. Or sister, because uh, it's yeah. not his sister, it's his wife. Right. Don't oh, mess well. with Sarah. Kind of both. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And um, um, and and Pharaoh listened. Yeah, exactly. He got scared and listened. Yeah. And so it makes me feel like, you know, because Pilate is going to be involved in, you know, the crucifixion of Messiah. Right. He was given an opportunity, or at least his family, sort of, through his wife. We're given an opportunity to maybe just maybe push back on it. Like, not that that was going to happen, right? Not that he was going to push back on it, but just so the scales are balanced. You know what I mean? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. That's all. Well, it's just made me think that there was, there, like you said, like, what was the dream? And then the other question is like, well, what was the purpose of the dream? You know what I mean? Yeah, that is a very good question. I'm going to bite my tongue until we get past everybody else's comments, but I think there's an answer to that. Oh, very so, good. I think so. I I'm think excited. there is, but I'm excited. I don't know. I can't wait. Um, Mono, uh, Matthew 21, 11, uh, sorry, 27, 11. When Pilate asked Jesus, if, uh, Yeshua, if he was the king of the Jews, and Yeshua replied that he was saying it, shows that some questions are not just questions. <clears throat> It shows me the levels of our being, that there was a spiritual fact behind the fact that the moment there, that there was a spiritual fact behind the fact that the moment came to ask. And the Lord from that time was silent in justice. At that time, at that moment, I understand the pilot shows humanity divided by religion. In another gospel, it shows that he wanted to deliver Yeshua and he could. But he answered the crowd and not his perception. This shows God's purpose being revealed in the midst of human free will. In Matthew 27, 15 through 21, human free will is shown to be evil with the choice of Barabbas. Um, and one of the, in one of the Bibles that I have in Portuguese from Portugal, it reveals that Barabbas was also called Yeshua. Mm-hmm. And that makes perfect sense when we read the bloodlines of Seth and Cain. The bloodline names are the same until Cain's bloodline is no longer mentioned. And it shows humanity in light and darkness. For example, while Enoch, descendant of Seth, was the man who walked with God, which means relationship and dependence, it shows that Enoch, descendant of Cain, was also the first city created in the world, which means humanism, man depending, depending on man, and being his own god yeah very very interesting mono mm -hmm. very interesting mm. good comment as well appreciate that uh where'd it go yep right there ricardo oh ricardo matthew 27 12 through 14 and when he was accused of the chief priests and elders he answered nothing then said Pilate unto him Hearest thou now, hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee and he answered him to never a word in so much that the governor marveled greatly this chapter is full of prophecies fulfilled this is a direct reference to isaiah 53 verse 7 he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before her shears is dumb so he opened not his mouth uh he continues on he says i've never checked this info but it is true as far as you know that Jews are not allowed to read from Isaiah 53. Modern day Jews are not allowed to read 
from Isaiah 53, yeah. Hmm. And in fact, many of their books, they have it actually taken out. But there's also Matthew, oh, what verse is it? There's a, there's a verse taken out of a lot of new Bibles too, uh, New Testament Bibles, Christian Bibles. Why am I blanking on this one? Come on, Nate. Mm, I'm going to get it. It'll come to me. Watch. <laughs> it's something 21. It jumps from 20 to 22. Is it Matthew 24, 20, 22, 21? If my memory is oh, that good. Is it my... might be something like that because I think we talked about it. For a Matthew. guy whose brain doesn't work very well. Let's see. You can continue. You can read on. I was just going to say hello, Ariella. Welcome. Ariella says hello from Texas. First time watching the live stream. Hi and welcome. Glad to have you. Um, all right. I'll continue with the next comment while you look that up. Jennifer Connolly, um, Matthew 27, 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Yeshua, he delivered him to be crucified. I can't get away from the water and the blood in this chapter. It is so powerful. I just noticed it with Judas. And when they said it was blood money, and the priests used it to buy the land to bury Judas and strangers, and the phrase, you see to it, and, and the phrase, you see to it, was used. That was blood-bought land. Then now here, Jehovah is so good, he's covering them with the blood of Yeshua and their children here. And the same wording you see to it. Then the final blood and water, which was when they pierced his side. Hebrew 9.14, the blood of Christ shed for our sake, cleanses our consciousness from acts and leads that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. The blood remembers the sacrifice at Golgotha and the mystery of the Last Supper, communion, and the water brings to mind the baptism. Water has the power to purify, to provide deliverance, and it can also destroy evil and enemies. The Lord's pierced side was prefigured by Adam's open side, out from which Eve was produced, Genesis 2, 21-23. The blood was typified by the blood of the Passover lamb, Exodus, and Revelations. Um, and the water was typified by the water that flowed out of the smitten rock, Exodus and the Corinthians 10.4. Mm-hmm. The blood formed a fountain for the washing away of sin, Zechariah 13.1, and the water became the fountain of life, Psalms 36.9 and Revelation 21.6. Yeah. Very good, Jennifer. Yeah. yeah. A lot of blood and water and uh, symbolism of the Bible. Yeah. Lots. So did you find it? Yeah, it's Matthew seventeen twenty one. Ah. Uh Mary also got it, and it's the verse about how the casting out of a demon. Ah. When they're like, How come we couldn't get rid of it? And then it's the passage that says Matthew uh says uh through prayer and supplication or prayer and fasting. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. So I, I found that interesting too. But yeah. it's, it wouldn't that be interesting? I, mean, I don't know. How many people read the Bible and then they're looking at the little number near every passage and they notice it says 2022. Yeah. What's funny though is that the, that the Bible that has it missing acknowledges there is a there was a passage there in some versions because it goes from 20 to 22 rather than renumbering them. Hmm. So that way, I guess, if you're looking at all the other passages, you don't notice it's really gone. Like you have to be looking for it in order to know. Now we covered that in the in the EBRT before. I'm just saying it's... Yes, there are Jews that are told not to read Isaiah 53 because it so clearly points towards Yeshua. And also some of their books are, uh, they've had, they completely removed it because of how much it points towards Yeshua. So pretty interesting, right? Yeah. Sharon Lewis Roberts, Matthew 27, verse 25. And all the people said his blood shall be on us and on our children. And the meaning of some sentences can be so easily read and missed. It seems they actually declared Yeshua's blood would save them and the following generations. So... They knew he was the Messiah, or maybe it was said, but they didn't know what they were saying. 
Sarah Peterson responds, I have thought about this before and it always stuck out to me. I personally am persuaded that they didn't realize the profoundness of what they were saying, but putting his blood on them and their children definitely seems to have the double meaning that their children would be saved by Yeshua's blood. I am persuaded that it was God's working in their choice of words to show his mercy to their children, even though they rejected Yeshua during this time. And then Jean, uh, Conrad, Lucier, I think what the Jews were expressing is that they were taking responsibility for the execution of Yeshua after Pilate washed his hands of it. But that makes for an interesting thought. I wonder if it has a double meaning, question mark. Okay, scroll to see if there's anything else. No? No. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, this part is so exciting to Nate. I love it so much. Oh my God. I'm going to get a You're concussion. the one who always wants me in person. I'm going to get a concussion. I like that. It was okay. fun. It was like, no. I, it just yeah. went on a ride. Do you have anything? No, you please. I well, mean, after that, you're going to say, do you have anything? Yeah, because I want. I don't want to say anything that somebody else has to say. So the, uh, the thing about Pilate, why, uh, you know, your question was, why did he wash his hands? Right? Is that what it was? Uh, no, mine was about the dream. What was the perfect purpose of the dream to the wife? Okay, well, it's all part of to me. It's all one yeah. thing. So I perceive it as if they if they had a a a heart about Yeshua deserves to die, then they would be conscious of it. So the Lord gave her a dream as the Lord gave Pharaoh a dream, so that they would be clean of the sin. Because the reason why the Lord gave Pharaoh a dream was so that he wouldn't be stuck in that sin and he'd have to smite them. That's, right. You know, that's what he tells Pharaoh, right? Right. And then Pharaoh's so scared that he's like, take a whole bunch of my stuff and get the heck out of here and never come back. <laughs> yeah. And of course, Abraham repeats that three times. Right. Um, so good tactic, I guess. <laughs> it is. It's a good business model. Very good business model. Um, and so... Um, so uh you know just making a joke lord just, yeah, just a joke for don't, sure you know don't smite us too uh so uh but then this i think the wife getting the dream and and she she's saying this right before and she's terrified right she's like do not like do this and then pilots already like i don't this guy doesn't seem to be harmful he doesn't seem to be trying to create mayhem and so he goes before him and he washes his hands. But I don't think it was, I think it was historically so that we understood that it wasn't the Romans who were persecuting him and killing him. Right. Right. It was indeed the Jews who were calling for the death. Right. So I perceive that the dream to his, to, from the wife to the husband and the husband responding and he's confused and he's stuck between a rock and a hard place between the politics Caesar wanting to kill him. And if you know history, you know that him and his wife ended up getting kicked out. And they had to live in the forest. <laughs> yeah, people. They, they lost their position. They lost the everything. They they had to go out and they yeah. had to live amongst the, the, the forest along with uh, the uh, kicked out Christians, actually, ironically enough. I don't know if they ever became Christians. There's no record of that. But <clears throat> that I know of, that I found anyways. Somebody does. That'd be cool. But I think it's I think it's spiritual. Like his hands are clean of it. You, you get what I'm trying to say, which I think is important for him and his wife. Yeah. And then the second part is, is it, it definitely explains that this is on the Jews. So, um, so this part too, that Sharon as talks about, I bring this up in videos in the past, and I know I had brought it up before in EBRT, but when we were talking about when they're so, so understand something here, and I'm just, I, I'm just recapping in case anybody is also new to the video series. Two days, two days before they're saying crucify him, the crowd is like, crucify him, crucify him, right? And then they say, we have his blood on us and our children. It does seem like a very weird thing. But, I, and I think that there's this massive disconnect because Christians have such, in my humble opinion, which is not going to sound humble, but is my humble opinion based on what I've seen and experienced, Christians have such a skewed misunderstanding of who and what Yeshua is to the Jews. Okay, and so when two days before Yeshua's crucifixion, they fill Jerusalem for the Passover, but the rabbis even acknowledge, do not get him yet 
because we want everybody to come into town, buy all their doves and do all their transactions and make all their tithing. And we know that they're coming into town to see this Yeshua guy. So don't grab him yet, because if they hear that he got arrested, they won't come into town and they won't spend their money onto the temple. So he's like, hold off on doing that. So they all come into the town, they all do their thing, they're getting prepped for the meal and all that, and they lay the palm trees and they watch him come in on a donkey through the gate. This is clear as day. The guy is so famous. He, he has brought one of the largest, if not the largest gathering of Passover that the temple has seen in a very long time. The priests are super excited about that part. They want to use him for it, right? So there's, there's an acknowledgement the Bible is telling us that people know who he is. They understand that he is the hopeful for the Messiah position, right? They're laying the palms at his feet of, of while he rides in on the donkey through the gate that's prophesied. And then just two days later, they're crying, crucify him. The other thing that's interesting is that even the high priests are like mocking him and they're continually mock him. They follow him. They follow him all the way up onto the cross. And I'm of the persuasion that why would they follow the criminal all the way onto the cross? Once he's like handed over to the authorities, like why would they follow him all the way up to the cross? Like, are they sadistic? And then the other thing is, is there's a, there's certain gospels that tell us that the women were lined up and mourning him. So now there were times where they would pay the women to do that. I don't know if most people know that. They would pay them so that the person had somebody mourning for them. Did you know that? Yeah, okay. So I'm thinking to myself, especially because a large portion of the believers at the time were Pharisees, they knew exactly who he was. They knew exactly what they were doing. And they really thought that he was going to jump off off the cross. They needed the fulfillment of his sacrifice to be done. And they thought he was going to literally save himself as he saved everybody else. And they're saying crucify him because they believe that he is Messiah bin David and that he's about to basically start shooting thunderbolts out of his fingers. You know what I mean? So, and that's not a part that you ever hear. And then when he doesn't, when he doesn't jump off and he's not basically like, you know, revealing he is Messiah bin David, everybody gets confused, including the apostles. And that also makes sense why the apostles themselves were confused when they watched him be taken away and get beat up so bad was because they're like, this doesn't match what we all believe Messiah is supposed to be, which we also talked in great lengths about. So, yeah, I, I just think like that part that people were saying crucify him because they actually believed is not often talked about. And I, I don't know who in the crowd were for him saying crucify him. But I believe that the people probably thought, especially the Pharisaical, the Pharisee priests or rabbis that were saying crucify him, they were probably sitting there going, well, this is what must be what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have them crucify him for saying this because this is going to be like, this is how this is all going to be fulfilled. Yeah. Am so I making sense? Yeah. They're thinking, okay, if he really is Messiah, yeah, then we are pushing... <clears throat> We're, 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 we're putting him in harm's way for the sake of the people. And we're, we're forcing the Romans who are our oppressors to commit the murder, which won't go through because he's really Messiah. So God and the angel, whoever is going to show up and they're going to stop this from taking place because he's really God's son. And we're all going to fall in, 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 and we, we will have done right because we vetted him exactly and he proved to be messiah and therefore no harm no foul we all drop on our face he saves he destroys the romans new israel new judah all is good so that's one thought and then the other option is well he's never messiah at all he then i guess he was a liar or that that's the, the yeah. priest thinking yeah he was a liar it's our job to vet anyone who says they're Messiah, who makes these kinds of claims. So if he's found out to be a liar, just like, for example, um, I'm thinking back to Levitical law about uh, infidelity. Mm -hmm. If, if uh, I think if it was a wife who was, uh, was, was suspected of infidelity, she'd have to 
drink the sand of the temple floor temple floor and if she was truly innocent then she would be fine nothing would happen but if she was not innocent if she was lying it wasn't the wife though it was either party either party yeah yeah <clears throat> right um uh if if the, Don't spouse... want the ladies getting mad yeah i know i just didn't want to be Thanks, inaccurate Alex. i didn't want to be inaccurate because i didn't remember exactly get, what okay, it said go. um but uh, anyway uh, if there was infidelity then the the lying party the, would... the lying party would die from uh, from drinking the temple sand so so this is probably the way they figure it is um if he's a liar then he'll die on the cross and he deserves that death because he lied about being king of the jews he lied about being david's son he lied about being god's son like all of that is a big no-no mm -hmm. but if he's telling the truth then it's up to god to like do what you're supposed you know save him and and be messiah and for him to be messiah right um but it's important i think too not to interrupt but that's a point that i wanted to make is that yeah for christians they don't think we really understand because we're coming in hindsight right yeah but for the jews they understood that the messiah ben david aspect there's two aspects right messiah ben david aspect of the messiah if, again if you're new if you've been around you know this we talked about it is the person will, won't die they call him son they call him a uh, uh, son of man right which they know and the priest rips his clothes because they know that that phrase is specific for actually the son of god is messiah guy and that specificity of that term being used specificity of that term being used and when you say son of man you mean son of adam son of adam yes exactly son yeah. of adam when when he when 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 that term is used on a person it means that they are god in flesh that's not translated in English. That's not translated to the Christian. But the Jews completely understand that. So it would make total sense that when the king that comes from David's bloodline, who David calls Lord, comes into existence, who is the Messiah, who is the son of Adam, right? That's the terminology. That They know that this guy can't be killed. So when they're saying crucify him, they're saying, and they're saying his blood be upon us, they know the prophecy that he's the lamb. They know the prophecy that he washes away the sins. They know the prophecy that he's going to come and have a thousand year reign kingdom that will last forever and ever. And I know that seems weird, but they kind of had this prophecy that said, well, it will be a thousand years on earth and then his kingdom will last forever and ever. So they basically perceive him as Superman. You can't kill him. Right. Like there's no kryptonite for this guy. So when they come into the city, they honor him, they recognize him, they make all the physical displays we perceive you to be messiah and then he gets captured and he's beat up but who's he captured and beat up by as far as the people who are in the audience perceive not by the jews by the romans by the romans exactly you guys are thought about that too so they perceive that the romans are beating him up and the jews at the time really thought that he was going to come and free the jews from the romans specifically Right. Right. So I'm just saying all this because there's people out there that, that just may not know all this. So when you read this sentence in the Bible where they're, the crowd is chanting, crucify him, crucify him. But two days earlier, they're absolutely proclaiming him Messiah. It doesn't make sense to us because of our understanding of what Messiah is and the hindsight. But for them, it made sense because they thought he was the invincible version of Messiah ben David that could not be killed. And when the Romans... <laughs> put him on the cross and beat him and did all these and, wrongs to him, then they would be guilty, and, regardless if they washed their hands in the tub or not. Yeah, exactly. And then there's also that psycho psychological uh, thing that they've got going on. So here's Yeshua. Here's this guy. Let, let me let me not talk about Yeshua. Let me talk about maybe whatever their perceptions might have been. They've now heard rumors. They may Some of them may have seen something, maybe a miracle, or they're, they've heard about these miracles. So this is a giant group of people, right? Like you said, the crowd of people, the mob. <laughs> Absolute mob. The yeah. mob wants, needs satisfaction. They want to know, is this it finally? Are we going to be rid of the Romans finally? Exactly. Is God finally going to show up and end our suffering here under this under this regime? Are we finally going to be, you know, exalted again? Are we going to be the prime prime kingdom on earth again? And so all of that, like everybody's that energy all that energy of like give it to me now already or stop bothering me with this like 
it's it's where people get really you know they just they they don't want to hear the parables they don't want to hear the wisdom which is the problem right mm. they just want the goodies right just bring the goodies already that's so so, yeah. so so yeshua that's why I, I believe that's basically judas too mm. that was partially i i believe that that could have easily been judas psychology as well like i've been walking around the desert for three years now it's all about Messiah, right? So when are we finally gonna get saved? <laughs> well, and not only that, <laughs> you know what I this, mean. And on the same dinner, he says, "By the way, you guys are gonna be killed for my name's sake." Right. Which and is... Judas is like, "Well, that doesn't match either." Yeah. So exactly. this is, this is the thing that also makes like the Christian disconnect so strong. It's like Christians don't understand the the even to this day, folks. If you go and you talk to like real Hasidic, like like walk with the bible as best as they modern can jews like if you should find one or a rabbi and you talk to them about the messiah they will talk about messiah to this day in the exact same way that the people in the bible that yeshua spoke about believed him to be it that has not changed at all which also tells me how absolutely accurate throughout history that the jewish concept and the jewish accuracy of the of their bible has been kept so like like because it's the exact same. It's absolutely actually kind of astonishing to me yeah. how much they still talk about him as the Messiah Ben David part. It, it, it's like they, they it's very you you it feels it feels a little heartless to us maybe because we're mm -hmm. so not used to that kind of approach. Yeah. But when you think about how doggedly like legalistic they are, exactly. Like there is no mosaic law that's like not good enough anymore. If we can't do it because the temple is there, we're we're that's our that's our suffering. Yeah, we need the temple so we can do that law too. Exactly. There, there is not a single word, which is so mind-boggling too, because they seem to miss the prophecies about Yeshua completely, and yet, well, they even avoid Isaiah. And avoid, so they will yeah, miss it. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like they've reached the, they've re obviously reached the wall, a block here, mm -hmm. which, uh, which the Bible, which the Bible prophesizes will happen. But yeah. uh, if other than that, if you look at how absolutely. Dog it, and we're talking about the really the Orthodox and the Hasids. We're not talking. I'm not talking about the reformist, um, the Steven Spielberg Jews. Yeah, yeah, well, well, the Steven Spielberg goes to temple. I'm talking about his temple and the way it's run and the rabbis there. I don't know. I'm not judging, but I don't believe they walk at the same level as say the Orthodox do. But anyway, point being, um. Not judging Spielberg, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't walk like the Orthodox Jew. They no, walk on no, Saturday. definitely. That... <laughs> I used to live in Beverly Hills. I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I even know what um, church Spielberg went to. Yeah, or temple, I should say. <laughs> okay, sorry, that was probably yeah. really loud. Um. Anyways. Anyways, yeah. you get the point. That this is this is why they're not looking at Yeshua and going, "There's a human. There's a being. A a a being that a loving human who did nothing wrong." They're not oh. seeing the heart of it. They are literally just like, when are the prophecies of this book and our entire, everything we believe and we've been sticking to, like, mad? And we, when is this, they're looking for that. They're completely focused, is what I'm saying. The priesthood as well. And unfortunately, that was the judgment upon them. You're so consumed about how, you're, you're, you're so consumed with the law, you forgot about kindness and mercy. And and they really display it here, don't they? Well, okay, so this is this is kind of like what I'm speaking to, though. So I'm glad that we're having a conversation and fellowship here. I think it's an interesting thing from for that I I personally I'm not telling anybody needs to agree with me. I'm I'm just this is just conversation, right? But do they display lack of mercy? Do they? Do they display lack of courtesy? And this is a mind melting, like really changing idea here about this, right? When I read this for the first time, I thought of it in the way that all the Christian churches that I had, the few I'd gone to had taught it. And then I read it again with the concordance and the translations. And then I studied the Hebrew culture and it changed my whole reality. Me personally, I'm just speaking of my own testimony here. It changed my whole reality. When we, when, when we're children, and we see something we want. Do we not just go, mommy, daddy, buy me that? Do we go, mommy, daddy, you know, how much money do you have? How how hard would it be or what kind of pressure would it be on you if you spent this blank amount of money, excuse me, on, on this thing that I would buy? Like we don't sit there and evaluate the struggle of a parent. 
the parent is there and we're so used to being like we want and it's funny because kids will say our house our car our finances our money right they everything is theirs too right yeah okay okay so since the jews are literally received themselves as god's actual children on earth if this is the messiah they've been waiting for and they are under the idea that he is messiah ben david then they understand that he is God in flesh. That's something that Christians have a hard time struggling, but Jews don't have a hard time struggling with that because of the Shema prayer, right? The Shema makes it very clear. So when the Jews are looking at this person who's getting beaten up, they're looking at God in flesh getting beaten up. Are they sitting there like, I'm sure that I'm sure, I'm assuming, there are definitely people watching being like, wow, he has gotten really beat up bad. The Romans did that to him, and he is about to really strike them with lightning, like, and really open up the world and swallow them up. And this is going to be amazing, but we've seen him heal, so we know he can snap his fingers at any time and heal himself. If you thought that somebody could literally sneeze and heal themselves, would you feel like as super bad as we as Christians do? If you thought that you were actually looking at God in flesh, or would you be sitting there being like, this is about to go down? I'm not saying that the, there isn't a reaction to the gore that we're seeing, right? But I'm I'm under the more of the impression that the people were like, you keep hitting him and you keep beating him and you take him on that cross. You have no idea who you're taking on the cross. We're saying crucify him because you guys are about to get handed it to you. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So I don't think that in that moment, the crowd, I'm not talking about the leaders, the pharisaical and the, you know, the rabbis and the head priest. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the crowd that had come from all over the world, as far as they knew the world, to come and be here on the Passover, being like their mindset. I'm under the understanding is like, this is about to go down because why were they laying palm leaves underneath his mule two days before? Why were they on the street lined up crying? Like, who paid them to do that? Nobody paid them to do that. I'm under the persuasion that those are people who authentically cared. Because who who paid for Yeshua to have mourners? Do you get what I'm trying to say? Like, the Bible doesn't tell us there was anybody paid to mourn for him. And and certainly people did. There Obviously, people did care for Yeshua. There of are, course. The, um, and I'm not saying they don't care. I just want to be clear on this. I, I'm just saying that it's like a child who perceives the invincibility of a parent, right? Like, you know how, like, you don't, like, if there's something that happens to a parent, you're not sitting there like, oh, my parent is going through a hard time. If you're a really young child, you're like, mommy and daddy are about to take care of this. And that's that, because that's what mommy and daddy always do, right? And if they're looking at God daddy in flesh, they're just like, he's about to take care of this. This is about to, he, this is pretty gory. This is horrible what's yeah. happening to uh, you. Um, um, but this is about to go down. I think that's a very persuasive viewpoint and a persuasive argument that it wasn't just that, that they weren't just hateful and for some reason uh, bloodlust had taken them over yeah. to crush Yeshua, um, that there was probably a very large element of exactly of what you're saying maybe wasn't quite as clear as what you described, maybe they weren't quite all as educated to know God and flesh and really, really understand the concepts enough. Uh, but they had the feeling that if he's truly who we think he is or who I've heard he is, then God, of course, is going to like hand it to the Romans. He's just going to rip the Romans in half. It's yeah. going to be all over and we'll point and we'll say the Romans demanded this. The Romans did this. Um, but we know from the apostles that the understanding of the Messiah Ben David part, the warrior, the soldier, king on earth part, was understood by everybody. It was not that the, that wasn't the part that people struggled to understand. That was the commonplace bit of knowledge that even the uneducated, unread knew, right? Yeah. And this is a passage Ricardo just pulled up. Scroll up for me for a second. So th there's so many passages. I'm, I didn't want to be long-winded in soapbox here, but Ricardo pulls up a passage that also proves that it was the chief priests. And who wanted this, right? Uh, but it says, Matthew 27, 20, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask Barbarus and destroy Yeshua. Then scroll down. And then, it, uh, and the multitudes were persuaded by uh, Caiaphas and company. So they were persuaded. So, the, so here's the thing is, you don't know, you're a normal person. You have an absolute super high reverence 
even if you hate them, because whatever for the corruption, right? But you have a super high reverence that the people in power know what they're doing. Even, oh, yeah. even I mean, today we do, right? Like we, we the, might know that they're idiots, the, but we're like, they got, there's got to be some part well, of them that know what they're doing. But I mean, when it comes to the rabbis, yeah, if you're a rabbi, God puts you there. You are authority. Exactly. And what you say about scripture, what you say about anything is basically, it just is. It just is. Yeah. So like, yeah, they don't, okay. they didn't question the priesthood. Yeah. But my, so that's my point, right? This crowd shows up, they're there for the Passover and the priests are saying, this is what we must do. You know, trust us in this. This is how this has to go down. So when we say crucify him, everybody together chant crucify him. And they're just probably sitting there being like, and they probably had persuasion and they probably used all sorts of ideas. So what I'm saying is, is like, we go from reading the Bible that they're praising him one day, two days later, they're like, kill that evil doer. And I just think that that is movies have done that to us. The Christianity mindset has done that to us. But I'm not of the full persuasion that a lot of the audience was actually sitting there going that evil do or kill him. The other thing is, is it says that every city Yeshua went to and he went to cities all over what was Israel and Rome at the time. And he healed every the Bible says every single person who was brought to him was healed. The Bible says that, right? So how many people is that? And like, I live now in a town of 3,000 something, 5,000 people, right? So when when somebody gets in a car accident or somebody breaks their leg, the whole town knows. And that's like three to 5,000 people, which is the amount of people that were then. If, if, if a whole bunch of people showed up to the clinic and all of them got healed of every disease from leprosy to blood issues to, I mean, my, everything, right? There'd be nobody in the town that wouldn't know. So my point is to say is like, here they are all gathered together on Passover. And now they're all like, this dude is Messiah. Put down the palm leaves, bring in the donkey. And then they're like, kill him. He's evil. It just doesn't make sense. And I'm under the persuasion through all the Christians I've talked to over the last 19 years that there's a confusion about this. And there's also this judgment of the crowd. Like these people are idiots. They were easily manipulated or they were so easy to forget what he had done for them. Like there's a very good chance that there's people in that crowd that were healed. Do you get what I'm trying to say? And they're now they're sitting there saying, crucify the guy who healed me from my leprosy, from my blindness, from my deafness, who, who allowed me to go back to work and provide for my family. Like, it's just like, it's insane to think that all these people in two days for, forgot that they thought he was Messiah two days ago. Do you get what I'm trying to say? And I think that this causes a lot of confusion with, with Christians because there be, and so what the way we have to do as readers is we have to demonize the crowd and just be like, they're morons and they're super manipulated. But because of the scriptures that, especially because of the scriptures that we just quoted, but I think that they weren't persuading them as to say, no, he's an evil guy. I think even if they thought he was evil, I think they were persuading the crowd being like, this is how we're going to find out if he is who he really is, which is what you said. So I know this is a long winded thing, but I feel like this is such a thing that I've never heard talked by any pastor. I've never heard it talked and I'm not saying it hasn't. I'm just saying I've never heard it talked about. And I've been waiting for so long, me personally, to have this conversation with the body of Christ to be like, if we really look at all the scriptures and we look at the culture, how can we think that the people, the majority of the crowd crying crucify him, were doing it with an evil heart? You, do you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Not to say that they're like hands are clean. I'm just saying I just don't think that they were two days later being like, yeah, that guy is a jerk. Let's all let's all chant kill him. It just doesn't it just doesn't compute for me. So there has to doing that more research brought me personally more understanding. That's what I'll say. Go I ahead. think I think that's a very good point. I think I think um uh you know. I think mixed I think there's there I think there's probably a whole gamut of things going on mm -hmm. just like in today just like today you see people who struggle with maybe accepting an uncomfortable truth oftentimes myself and all of us have gone through this we'll want to come back to kind of the established hierarchy of the world and say I just I I, I this is too much I'm just going to listen to what Caiaphas says because he's the priest okay mm -hmm. if God wanted me to not to listen to Caiaphas he would have made this guy the priest or something and then this guy would have been the authority and not Caiaphas this is too much for me to figure out I can't decide I don't know Caiaphas says kill him 
You know what I mean? There's probably a decent amount of people, a large amount of people who may have felt that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or they had heard rumors or heard about people being healed, but they never met Yeshua himself. Ex so. Exactly. Doubt, you know, springs eternal, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, uh, I, I could see the whole gamut. But I, I do believe that the way the priesthood could have you know, the rationale I can imagine that the priesthood would have used to absolve themselves of feeling like maybe we're putting an innocent man to death a little, this is a little harsh, um, at the very least, right? That that first thought of compassion that I think they were blowing right past that. And they were telling themselves that if he's truly Messiah, just like we've talked about, just like you just said, if he's truly Messiah, he's off that cross, this isn't happening. Right. If he's not Messiah, well, he definitely deserves this for deceiving us. And that's it. So real quick, just so people don't think that that's just an opinion that I personally pull out of thin air as well, or Alex might agree with, I don't know. But when there is a conversation, forgive me, I don't know the passage, but it might, I think it's in a few of the Gospels, at least two, where, where the high priest says it is better, because they're talking about, we need to kill him, right? And, and then he says, it is better for one man to die for the sake of all the people than right. for all the people to be basically uh beaten and you know destroyed. destroyed for one man right so in a way he's already acknowledging what the role of this man could be right he's already acknowledging him as the lamb right yeah and then he says who do you say that you are and then he he does rip his clothes and he says you heard it for yourself he makes himself equal to god which is a sentence again that will confuse christian but then they follow him to the cross and then they say okay this is your moment come down from there yeah right so if you add up these things they read as taunting right but in a way it could be also that there you let us remember too that the that the that the temple at this time is not having miracles so the only understanding of god that the priests are interacting with is the scriptures themselves and they fight over the scripture because the there's two full denominations and let's say 40 percent to 30 percent of the population believes that the messiah is nothing more than a fairy tale and those are called the sadducees right and so they're constantly been fighting with each other for the 300 or so years leading up to yeshua and maybe the high priest even doubts himself Maybe he's just like, man, they made some really good points that this Messiah character might be actually this. I mean, we don't even have a temple that has the Uman Therma. There's no Holy Spirit inside the temple as we can see it, right? Like, how do we know that all that was lies that our parents told us, right? We've never seen it. So what I'm saying is, is imagine you're the authority. Imagine you, do, you believe in God, but you don't want to lead people astray. You have half of your entire body of leadership saying, you guys are idiots. Do you not realize this is all just for lessons it's all for just teaching it's not literal the adam eve the that's all this stuff that's a sadducee saying this and you might be like man and if you're toting the line because you know of all that kind of not necessarily votes but they did vote for the next person to be high priest and stuff mm. it's there's there's a thing of you're like, actually describing something genius here you're describing the pharisees having a crisis of faith yes as yeshua shows up yes they've have that's why you have the sadducee movement in the group in in israel because they have never nobody's ever seen a miracle really exactly and they're like hey guys will you stop believing in fairy tales then mm -hmm. let's just accept this like you're saying as a lesson yeah and then he rips his clothes saying like i'm i'm at least doing what i was told to do yeah. and if this guy is the messiah that we pharisees believe he is he's going to jump off that cross and nobody can kill him but I'm at least going to go through the motions. Again, I hate to use it here, but controlled folly. I'm going to at least go through the motions so that when I get judged by God, he won't say I was a bad high priest. Actually, I believe Caiaphas was a Sadducee. Okay, so uh, I think yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. So, so well, that would actually also make sense. It would make sense because the Sadducee he doesn't would, believe that he the, doesn't believe that the Messiah is a thing. Exactly. So he's going to push this to prove to the rest of the Jews. Right that they need to stop waiting for a mirac miraculous messiah and right. they need to just pick up the sword and be willing to do it themselves and there was a transition happening at the time of power and there was a battle between the pharisees and the sadducees if you guys don't know i know we're going in such such detail here but i feel like i don't know i guess it's just important to me so it's like there was a there was a struggle of power and they were trying to influence the people to follow one of the two major basically denominations 
right? And what a great way to win people over to Sadducee. If right. the guy who supposedly is doing miracles, right? Yeah. Can't take himself off the cross. Yeah. Right? Booyah, told you, told you there's the Messiah is symbolic and not literal. Yeah. Like, what a great and, example, right? Yeah. And I, what's crazy is I remember recently reading the Temple Institute website, which you've turned people on to, which is awesome. And uh, they're still talking about how wrong the Sadducees are. Mm -hmm. And and they're, they're still like the, the, the bad, bad movement in Judaism that that is still plagues them to this day mentally. Yeah. Which makes sense too, because if you think about the last 2000 years of the Jewish people, where are those saving miracles, right? Where is the Messiah? Look at the stuff they had to live through, you know, just to bring back, you know, the, the obviously just World War II, right? Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you look back to all of that and you go, man, the Sadducee mindset mm -hmm. is so strong in the Jewish community. Yeah. Uh, and and it's still such an enemy to the more devout Pharisaic mindset, which is still the predominant, which is still the predominant one, and you know, in the, at the head of the uh, priesthood, of course. But they still have to have that fight because they still haven't seen the miracles all that often. And to this day, that's to this still day, the case. Exactly. That's still the case. So good. I'm glad that we had this full conversation. I know we took some time and soapbox on this, but. I just think that this will give us such a different understanding to Scripture, especially as we read it in the next three Gospels, about what this what this situation probably really looked like compared to kind of the Christianity version that we see in movies, where it's like people are loving him two days before, and then they're literally, the whole crowd hates him and wants him dead two days later. And I just, I, I'm, I feel it heavy on my heart especially after I learned about the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, about what they believed about the Messiah's role and what he was supposed to do when he came the first time, uh, you know, just the misunderstanding about that. It just, I just think we, I just think that it, we will learn a lot more about ourselves, about our future, about, uh, about God's people and about Yeshua himself and about what we're seeing in the gospel at this time. If we actually understand the people who were there that day who were healed by him and walked with him on that day and watched him on the cross die. Like, I think, it, it, and there's a lot more history that we'll get into that's not necessarily in the Bible, but there's history that was archaeological digs and things like that that I do want to just bring up as we move through the, the New Testament, which prove that people did receive Yeshua. And I'll just say it now because tomorrow's not promised for anybody. When the temple veil was ripped and the temple was shook by the earthquake when he died, they built two two different camps outside of Jerusalem where people continued to um, sacrifice um, like onto um, the temple, but it quickly died off because the Jews were being turned into Christians so much so that that like it basically was destroying the, uh, the, the Jewish nation. Like there was no more, the temple became no, had no more value. And that led to what happened in the 70 AD war with Rome. So the fact that there were so many Jews believing Yeshua was Messiah, 95% of all believers on earth were Jews until, until basically the Council of Nicaea, which was 325 AD. So, so majority of believers were Jews. It started to move over to the Gentiles basically after the 70 AD war. And then it was basically became like 80%, 90% Gentile after council of nicaea and then the jews left they left the faith after the council of nicaea because what they had put in place went against the shema and went against the old testament and went against the the bible the the the, the messiah that they knew because they had made a gentile messiah and it wasn't the jew mess, men, messiah even the yeshua jew messiah they believed in after his resurrection right so i know i'm, I'm being kind of confusing here but this is like if you if you've ever wondered how do we go from the Bible to how we got to the faith style of Christianity we have today, it starts right here with the misunderstanding of the crowd that was chanting "Crucify Him." It, that, in my research and in my humble opinion, the 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 link disconnect, the abyss that stands between that day and our day, where we can't figure out how Christianity became Christianity from the Jews, it's because we have demonized the people. Who are in the crowd and it starts this domino effect 
and we don't learn the history of the Jews who did believe he was Messiah, and we only learn about the Christian Gentiles. And so Christianity doesn't really start for us modern day folks until 324, 325 AD. But in reality, the greatest form of Christianity that had walked the earth yet was between the time that Yeshua died to really like 150 AD. And then the persecution of the Christians came and that was when things started to go south. And the line was clearly drawn in the sand at the 70 AD war, which is where the Jews produced a Messiah ben David and he got killed. <laughs> they actually called him Messiah. He marched out against Rome on a horse. He did not perform miracles. They claimed him to be Messiah. And when he went out, they killed him right away. And then 500 Jews a day were killed during the 70 AD war until the temple and every stone was taken down. So there's a whole thing there. I know I'm ranting. I soapbox, but I hope I hope I hope I'm not speaking out of my flesh. I hope this is a blessing to anybody who's who's hearing this particular conversation right now. That's really that's really deep and good and interesting. Wasn't too ranty? No. Okay. It was awesome. And it turns it's a it's appropriate to talk about it now because these these um you know the the common interpretation, the easy interpretation of this, even after you've read all of it prior prior maybe maybe after having re read all of it prior it sounds a lot more plausible that what nathan's saying can very much be true but um but still the easy interpretation of this is that the jews were just poopy they were just meanies they <laughs> they were betrayers they were bad yeah they were there was this was an evil generation like yeshua said a generation of vipers mm -hmm. and that's why they all did this and that's what it all means yeah and um but he doesn't say that to the sinner like the normal sinner. He says it to the priesthood. Exactly. So that, but, that's a distinction that we talked but, about in old videos too. Yeah, but because of the verbiage. And then the Jews did this, and then the Jews grabbed that, and exactly. they, he, he was given over to the Jews. It starts to sound very much like, um, just like I said, easy interpretation. You just blame the whole group. Right. Right? It's just the whole group. Um, and real quick, because you talked about something, and... And and uh, somebody made a post live right now, but it's already gone up off the screen. The other thing is, is well, maybe the people in the crowd had not read the Torah or the totality of the scrolls themselves that day. The truth of the matter is they did not, and that was an almost intentional. I don't know if you guys know this, but Jews cannot read scripture in any other language. It, like the real faith believers, they can't read scripture in any other language than Hebrew. And so um, the thing was, is that Jews at the time didn't speak Hebrew. I don't know if you guys knew that. They spoke Aramaic. So that's why when Yeshua is on the cross and he says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't say it in Hebrew. He says it in Aramaic, which is the, the what, what kind of English is in the world right now, right? Every Basically, almost all countries teach their people English so the whole world can communicate to some degree. Well, back then, the global language was actually Aramaic. It wasn't even Roman so um, or Greek so the, or Latin, I should say, too. So the thing that I'm saying is, is that like, if you were to ask yourself, well, did the Jews read the Torah? The answer is actually no. Most of the Jews didn't speak Hebrew, which is one of the ways when the Bible talks about how the Jew uh, priest would put scripture on their bodies and walk around and they put the, the scripture on their forehead and walk around and be seen. Most of the crowd didn't know what those scripture pieces were saying because they were in Hebrew. And the other thing was, is that when they tested Yeshua, Whenever he spoke about, um, whenever he would read scripture or whatever he would like study scripture, the reason why they were so shocked was because he would have read it in Hebrew. And they were like, well, we didn't teach this kid this. We didn't find, we didn't, who taught this kid Hebrew? Because the only people that really understood Hebrew were the super, like the wealthy or the educated and the priesthood. And they did, and nobody could, nobody could question them. And that's why you hear the priest go, are you telling us we are these people? You tell us about the scripture, which they say to the to the uh, to the uh, the disciples, right? And they he's like, you're going to tell us about this. They knew they didn't read Hebrew, so uh, am I making like there's a yeah. whole thing there. So if you know that the generation that lived at that time, the Jews mainly spoke Aramaic and they couldn't read the scriptures because they were in Hebrew, that tells you right there how illiterate they were. The only way that they understood scripture was what was told to them by when they went to temple. And then they were told it like we have on our, basically today in Sunday churches. You go, somebody stands there and tells you what to believe or tells you what to understand about what the scripture is. And they would read it in Hebrew and then they would translate it in Aramaic or another language. 
Isn't that crazy to think about? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Jake says, oh, this is from John 1148. I think it speaks to, I think it speaks to what you were just saying. Um, if we allow him to go on like this is lifetime comments. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. Uh, this is the uh, new uh, li living. The NLT. Yeah, the NLT version. Thank you. If everyone believes he was Messiah, would Romans go to war because they see him as a threat because of prophecies? Absolutely. That's what they did at the 70 AD war. So the great thing about your question, Jake, is history actually tells us that. When the Jews grab this guy and they say he is our Messiah and he literally rides on a horse to Rome claiming to be Messiah, it's the reason why Titus was given the authority to absolutely and utterly destroy the temple. It was so that they could eradicate the idea of the Jewish Messiah. So your question was actually answered in the year 70 AD. How awesome is that? Yeah, and and um, I love God. He's so um, good. Uh, before the second part of your question, real real quick, is if you think about why would Rome care to crush something that in they thought was a superstition? Well, Rome itself was a superstitious religious culture. Mm -hmm. They just had a pantheon, mm -hmm. but through that they controlled a vast empire, and they had rules. They were very, very tolerant of other religions, so long as those religions were tolerant of all other religions. Yep. So the, they didn't care what you believed as long as you didn't challenge the authority of the emperor. Well, they there was so, one, the first rule of religion in Rome was you cannot believe in one way to heaven. That right. was the first rule. You can Google it and find that out. You're not allowed to believe in the reason they did that was so that every culture they conquered, those gods were incorporated into the entire Roman pantheon, like you said, like the yeah. entire faith system of Rome, and it was legalized that way. And so if the Jews were, they even talk about it in the Bible, how the Jews were considered like hard-headed, you know, kind of low-minded because they wouldn't let go of their one God, one way to heaven. And that was their crime, and but they kept to themselves. But when they started, a, a, uh, you know, basically being um, sharing the gospel and going out and basically converting, that was when it became a massive problem. So yeah. just yeah, didn't mean to interrupt you, but that's, that's it. What... And I'm saying like it's 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 not that they thought that this guy, whoever might be, it's not that they believed in Messiah and they must dis destroy him because they believe in the prophecies. It's the opposite. It's that they want they don't want any more of that because it muddles it muddles their value system and their faith system and they want to build the greatest giantest empire and they want to have everybody included their culture and their values reflected um they did want everybody included they essentially wanted one world government they that's, did that's what that's they what wanted on, yeah. okay so continue reading your comment though yeah. i also wonder if satan go ahead go ahead i also wonder if satan had a spiritual say in this if it was a position where if he ha if he died, he'd save everyone with his blood and defeat him. But if he didn't die, he just continued to do even more damage to his kingdom. And so him being killed was like biting the bullet. And it was just a loose, loose situation, lose, lose situation for Satan. Or maybe the giving him too much, too much credit and he wasn't that involved. I don't think Satan had any power in this because... Um, if Satan knew who he was, he would not. He would have done everything in his power to stop him from dying, because the moment that Yeshua dies, he broke the contract, and that's a whole thing that we actually had discussion on in the beginning of this whole thing when we're reading Adam and Eve. There's like this kind of contract, if you will, with Satan that when man messes up, Satan gains the world, which is why the Bible even says, even Yeshua says that the world is Satan's, and that happened in the Garden of Eden. And so, if Satan knew who he was which is why I believe he tests him in the desert. He's like, oh, if you're this person, then do this. Oh, if you're this person, then then the angels will keep you from falling off the cliff. So do this. It's like the, the whole reason was is because I don't think that Satan actually had the ability to know he was who he was. And so he tested him and he tried him and he did everything he could. And so that was, the, and, and I think that because every other human on earth has always failed at least to one point, Every human has failed to some point that, you know, he would he had to go. And then Yeshua makes a very powerful statement and he says, nobody kills me, but I give up my life willingly and I take it back. So that means that Satan had absolutely nothing to do with Yeshua's death or 
at the involvement of his resurrection, like Satan was powerless in all things Yeshua. So that, and it's, it's very, a very clear statement that Yeshua makes about that. So very good comment. Thank you for that. All right. Soapboxed quite a bit there. Got off track a bit, but not off track really, right? Right. No, no. Oh, I really do hope this was helpful, guys. I really, I feel awkward when I kind of go on these, these bits, but it's just such a thing to me. It's so weird. It feels awkward because I feel like I'm taking over the camera and I'm it's, talking. It's Nobody so can weird really that shut you're, me up. that you're sharing your great understanding and wisdom. Yeah. It's so strange. Oh, it's super strange. I know. What are you going to do with me? <laughs> We're live. We're in person. Yeah. We get to shake each other. It's great. Shake each other. I love this show so much. <laughs> okay. Continuing on. Here we go. Okay. Take four. Getting back on track. We're on mono, right? Uh. Or no? Did we read this one? Yeah, that was the one that I was commenting on about. Yes. The everything I just said. Right. Yeah. Um. And again, I have to say it as a clause. You know, you don't have to agree with me. This video series isn't about you like hearing me say stuff or somebody else say stuff and you agree with them. But but I guess what I'm really trying to say is this was something I felt I needed to do. And so if you hear something I said and you're like, that's strange, but I'd like to look further into it and you find out more information that either confirms, further confirms what I've looked into and, and been persuaded of, or you find something that totally derails what I looked into and found, you know, I welcome that at the beginning of next video. You can post it on the next graphic uh, and we will read it live next video. So, you know, this is a, a fellowship and it's not you know, listen to that guy, those two guys on the camera. It's it's not that at all. It's a total conversation. So welcome. All Absolutely. right. Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, um, I just I just remember with started with this comment, Sharon, about his blood shall be on us and on our children. Um, that's why this conversation was important because when you when when we when I first read a line like this, I'm like, oh boy, they whoa, know. they just brought on some stuff on themselves. Yeah. Whoa, boy, and then then immediately your my head starts to go. Uh, well, maybe this explains the suffering that followed for for Israel or for the Jews, right? Um, and maybe maybe somewhere it does, but we're talking about, I think you also mentioned here, down here, was there a double meaning? Mm -hmm. And I think all, all of it applies. This is the beauty of the Bible, is that we have found so many times where um, you read the line both ways and both ways are true. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Um, There's a live comment from Ricardo. He says, from all you said, I only have this one question. No miracles. I think I remember the body of water that when it moves, the first one getting in there was healed. Smiley face. That is a good comment, but I was specifically talking about the priest not having miracles in the temple, but no miracles on earth. I didn't say that. Uh, but as for like the priest originally had the ability to quote unquote interact directly with god with the uma and thurman so i'm glad that you asked that question i'm glad you're giving me the opportunity to clarify however i will say that i think the moving waters that the crippled man tried to get to every day for like 20 years but could never get somebody to bring him in i think anybody should look into that more whether or not that was a god thing or whether it was a pagan thing and the other thing is, is whether anybody was actually healed from it or whether it was just a um, superstition. That's something that that we can all just look into, but I don't know if we all know the truth of it, but it was not something that was, quote unquote, in the temple. And it was not on something that we can, quote unquote, say that it was of God. Right. So that's a that is a that is another thing that it, it, there's a, there's things to look at about the water moving that actually had to do with other idols in the area and the and and that particular pool right so just so so yeah i'm being specific in the comment i made about that this second temple only had one miracle but it was not in this generation that yeshua was with and that miracle was where the festival of lights hanukkah came from and that was because the lamp stayed lit even though they ran out of oil that was the only miracle even according to scripture even according to the jews that happened at that time period so that that was what I was talking about. So thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Uh, okay, next comment, Mono. Um, the crucifixion process narrated in Matthew twenty seven twenty seven through forty three shows the face of the Lord's suffering on our behalf to the extent that none of us would endure the humiliation and questions asked by the soldiers without the faith given by the Holy Spirit. The Lord suffered to such an extent that he became unrecognizable as a human being. The red cloak is also the representation of sin. 
I understand that Yeshua wore blue, and I understand that this was the color of the garment that the soldiers did not share because of its value. From what I researched about it, the color blue was a very expensive color at the time because it was difficult to get, and I understand that the color blue has the meaning of God's justice. The sky is blue and the sea is blue. God's mercies reach to heaven, Psalms 57.10, and our sins are cast into the depths of the sea, Micah 7.19. Mm. Have you ever thought that the sea no longer exists in Revelations 21.1? Hallelujah. This shows his perfect sacrifice. The place of the skull, Golgotha, was the place of exclusion. The information I have is that Golgotha was made from the remains of the stones used to build the temple. And to me, it shows what is written, the stone which the builders rejected. Hmm. And in the process of crucifixion, the criminal sentence was nailed to his head or hung around his neck. And Matthew twenty-seven thirty-seven shows that Yeshua's sentence was to be king of the Jews. What appeared to be Satan's triumph in crucifying Yeshua was actually his defeat. This shows that the Lord carries out his work through free will. I, I understand the temptations for the Lord to come down from the cross, show the devil's temptation equivalent to the proposal he made when he told the Lord to throw himself from the pinnacle of the temple. If the Lord came down from the cross, he would prove in power that he was the Son of God. But it would imply our condemnation as he would have succumbed to the temptation of the evil one. This shows what the life of the Spirit is. Often we look in the Spirit for what is not in the spirit. We must understand that the communication of the spirit here is this reality, in this reality, is believing. Believing is the speaking of the spirit. That's why the Antichrist will offer signs. For just as we can see in the crucifixion, the devil's strategy involves greatness and the manifestation of stratospheric powers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's true. a very good point. Oh, it continues. And the manifestation of the Lord's power is faith. The Lord died in faith. When the Lord cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is not for lack of faith, but our lack of faith crucified in him, as we can see in Psalm 22. And the Lord's cry was answered in yet another cruelty. The sponge soaked in vinegar was the sponge they used to clean themselves after defecating. When, oh. When, oh, I didn't know that. When defecating, they took this bucket to clean themselves. Vinegar is the corruption of wine, and I think the co contamination by human feces shows the perversity of what was happening. The Lord said that he would no longer drink wine at supper, and the devil was extremerizing man's wickedness before God with a fermented and contaminated wine. I never heard that before, but that is even more significantly heart-wrenching more gnarly yeah. and 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 that's the point actually also is if you know since we're talking about this um this those were roman soldiers <laughs> right that were around yeshua those were not those were not the priesthood they were not giving him vinegar and and they were not you know what i mean right kind of speaks to what you were saying that they were not doing this out of cruelty right they were doing this out of um, whether it's a crisis of faith or a, or a need to know, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that was their perhaps their prime motivation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Okay, Vicky Richardson, Matthew twenty seven twenty eight, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. The word scarlet comes from the Greek word kokinos, which is a crimson color insect. Uh, I went down a rabbit hole and found some information that I thought was interesting. The color scarlet comes from a crimson worm that attaches itself to a tree and covers her eggs. When the eggs hatch, they eat the mother and her blood drips down the tree, which is how they got the scarlet dye. The mother cru sacrifices her life for her children as Yeshua did. He gave up his life on a tree so that his children might be washed with his crimson blood. Yep, wow. I've heard about that. That is awesome. Thank you, Vicky, for that reminder. That's really that's and that information. That's really great, right? Mm. God, tell me there's no God. Can't do it. I mean, can you? Can't do it. I mean, there's too many details, man. Yeah, and just wow. God's good. He sure is. Um, Sharon Louise Roberts, Matthew twenty-seven, 
verses 29 to 31, even though it's a heartbreaking passage, the way they put a scarlet robe on him, knelt before him, and hailed him a king, shows to me that even though they were mocking, they were actually showing the truth that everyone one day will kneel and say he's king. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have to be a believer, which is right. In, right? You're yeah. not, you don't have to be a believer to kneel down and say he's king. Every knee will bow and say he's king. Yeah. You think you're mocking him, but who gets the last laugh? Uh, right? Ricardo. Not Ricardo gets the last laugh, but Yeshua does. <laughs> Matthew 27, 31. This is Ricardo. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off. And so his comment is, so the garment that the soldiers were casting lots after was not the scarlet robe, but actually his clothing. I know that all the images and paintings and crosses show that Yeshua had left what it looks like underwear from that time. Some t something in my heart makes me sad by thinking that the most probable, well, probably he was scorned at that point of being exposed and humiliated by being fully naked. I know it doesn't say that, but still. On the same line, oh, what are you doing? Sorry. Uh, okay, I thought you were trying to hurry me up. Uh, on the same line of, it doesn't say, Matthew before in verse 26 only said, when he is scourged Yeshua. When he had scourged Yeshua. Scourge in Greek is uh, pergelo from a presumed equivalent of the Latin flagellum to whip that is lash as a public punishment. Paul wrote about of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes save one, but this was from the Jews, not the Romans. And according to how punishment was to be described in Deuteronomy 25 two, lashing, stripping couldn't exceed the amount of 40. The same feeling of not all details being told saddens me again, thinking that probably the Romans lashing was more brutal than the one commanded in Deuteronomy. Yeah, I think they, they, Yeah. We'll get to it. I'm going to not um, say anything. Uh, just a question came to my mind. Um, is it possible also that there was a moratorium on, meaning a ban, on Jews exercising justice upon themselves, at least without first seeking the um, the approval of Rome, right? Well, there is scripture where he says, this crime we can't condemn. You have to do it. There's a scripture that where the priest says that. So the priest tells Pilate. We can't condemn. They're like, why don't you handle him? And he goes, for this crime, we can't do it. You have to do it. Because it's a because it's a capital punishment. It's death punishment. Yeah. So he says, we can't do it. And then he scorns him, thinking that they'll let they'll like it'll be enough. It's not until after they scorn him right, that they try to crucify him. Yeah, yeah. That they would discourage them from wanting to kill yeah. the guy. Yeah, once they saw how badly beaten he was, they, yeah. would, they would say, okay, that's enough. Right. So, yeah. but they do tell him, we can't be the ones to do this. We, we don't have, your Rome has not allowed us this level of, like, if you steal, I can put you in jail. If, you know, you do this or something like that, I can do this, right? If you walk in drunk in public, I can do this. But when it comes to somebody being put to death or being put on trial for a death crime, we're not allowed to do that. That has to be you. Actually, that brings a very good question. Is, did, did whatever crimes the priesthood um, accused or convicted um, Yeshua of, were those crimes actually capital punishment by Mosaic law? Yes. 100%. So he said, when he says we don't have the authority to do it, or we can't do it, doesn't mean that we can't do it by, by, by biblical or by Mosaic authority. Right. We can't do it because Rome won't let us do it. He says that. It's yeah. explained. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. So that's my point. That's another thing where the Jews feel like they can't, they can't practice, they can't even live out their faith fully because anything that they decide to do that has to do with how you handle humans how you deal with crime any of that you have to go ask rome for permission or you have to convince rome to do it which is why they're using rome to to you know and not you get what i'm saying the they're, they're following roman law and then the, and then the romans are the ones to blame for yeshua's murder if if he's messiah um 
Jews haven't committed any crimes at all. If he's Messiah... And he gets put and, to death. And he's being put to death by Rome. Um, um, and, and then he comes off the cross. They didn't do it. They didn't do anything wrong. Right. Well, they still beat him up, chained him, and well, accused they, him. Well, they, and then they discommunicated mis well that's another thing is it maybe you know our conversation today made me think how much how much brutal how much did they brutalize him before they brought him in front of rome and outside of a maybe a spit a slap no they punch him i mean they beat it, him does it say that in the scriptures because yeah. i know i saw that in the passion yeah they no but, they it says they punch him okay. when when they're mocking him and it says like he gets punched from one side then he gets punched from another side and then they're like oh where did that punch come from Oh, okay. And and then he goes, tell us. Was it in Matthew? It probably wasn't it's in a Matthew. Matthew. It's in Matthew. Yeah, we read it. So real quick, uh, Alex Mukin. Yeah, send me an email here at uh, Yeshua Messenger, and uh, you're more than welcome to. We could do something like that. We put that stuff together, and we do that stuff uh, all the time. So feel free to shoot me an email, and we'll set that up. Welcome to Yeshua Network. So yeah. Uh, I do I do ask you, Alex, to, um, to do a little heart check, though, bud. Uh, I know, I know you're the, I know you're, uh, you're very um, sure about certain things you're writing here live, uh, but you know, I welcome you to come, shoot me an email, and we'll talk, and we will set that up. That that thing that you're asking about, we'll set that up. Okay, so, but come, come with the right heart, bud. You're, you're, you come with the right heart, and we will welcome all that kind of stuff. Many blessings. Okay, um, uh, yeah. So it does stay. All right, very good. There you go. Ricardo has it. So if we can post it real quick, you want to read it? Yeah. Um, and then we have a comment from Vicky I just copied, so we'll read that. Okay. Um, Ricardo says, They led therefore Yeshua from Caiaphas into the Praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium, and they uh, that they might not be defiled, but that, they, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate therefore went forth from them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not doing evil, we had not delivered him to you. Pilate therefore said to them, Take him, you, and judge him according to your law. And the Jews therefore said to him, It is not lawful to us to put anyone to death. See? That the word of Yeshua might be fulfilled, which said, signifying by what death he was about to die. The Jews couldn't crucify. Right. Crucifixion was a particularly Roman punishment. Right. Yeah. And that's what they did at the 70-80 war. 500 people were crucified a day. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. That was a busy group of soldiers. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Horrible. Um, uh, Vicky had a lifetime comment. I copied it down here. It. You want to read it? Or you, no, I go ahead. Uh, Vicky says, I didn't have time to post today, so I'll post it now. Hope it's okay. Of course it's okay. Um... Uh, Matthew twenty seven twenty nine. In twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, "Hail, King of the Jews! God, we have such a beautiful picture here. We see them mocking mocking Yeshua by putting on a scarlet robe and a crown of thorns and kneeling before him, saying, "Hail, King of the Jews!" Go back to Isaiah. God said, "To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance." Then going forward to Revelation, we see Yeshua coming back with many crowns in a robe dipped in blood. I wonder if Yeshua was thinking of his glorious return while they were mocking him. God brings this full circle. Amen. Mm -hmm. I have to be of the persuasion he was thinking of it. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why, but I just had, I'd like, to me, I need to believe that he was just like, I don't know. It's like when a, like if a, five or six year old was picking it's not the same i get it trust me i understand what i'm saying but like i perceive that yeshua being fully man but also fully god he had something in him that just rose above so high that that's also how he was able to totally keep his composure yeah you get what i'm trying to say yeah. so like and i believe that he was he he was thinking about the everything the part that we can't see too the eternal, the beyond, the millennia and everything. You know what I mean? Right. He's like, I know why I'm doing this. I know why it needs to be done. Not going to be fun, but I know what it needs, why it needs to be done. And he was thinking about that why, you know, which is his yeah. love for us and his redeeming us onto him. You know, yeah. I, that's just how I have to think about it. Because I just, I don't know. Maybe it's my... Well, I, I don't see why my that... My brain has to be like... <laughs> yeah. 
we have to we have to what what when we imagine that scenario, we it's we so horrible. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, he, there has to be a there has to be some kind of good. In like, I don't know how to word it. You guys, I, I think you guys understand what I'm saying. But yeah, yeah. R very good comment there, Vicky. Thanks, Ricardo. Matthew twenty seven thirty two. And as they came out, they found a man of cream, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Same in Mark fifteen twenty one. And they compelled one Simon of. Uh, is it Cyrenian or Kyrenian? What do you think Cyre it is? Cyrenian? Is it Cyrenian? I think it is. Mm -hmm. Who passed by coming out of the country and the father of Alexander and Rufus to bear his cross. And Luke 23, 26, as they came, led him away. They laid hold on one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Yeshua. Question. Yeshua was not forced to carry his cross? John 19, 17 says he did. Maybe John missed or forgot about Simon the Cyrenian. The common agreement about this is that even, even it is not mentioned that Yeshua carried the cross until he couldn't do it anymore, and then it was Simon comes into the scene and carries it for Yeshua. What do you guys think? I, I hate to do this, but even when I read it, truly, like, even when I read it the first time, I was under the persuasion that the guy carried both Yeshua and the cross. Like, how the Passion of the Christ did it, basically. Like, Yeshua was basically, like, looked like he was carrying it, but the Simon guy was actually carrying the cross, and Yeshua was probably just trying to march along. I mean, the Bible tells us that he was beat so bad that you couldn't recognize him. So... If you've been beaten that bad, you're not exactly lifting up like a huge cross tree thing and carrying it. I just probably not very far at all. I mean, unless your shoe was in amazing shape, <laughs> he's like yeah. he's like honored. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. I don't perceive. I'm not making a joke of the situation. I'm just saying it's hard for me to imagine that somebody beat that bad was carrying a cross that far and i don't know if like yeshua was just walking by himself and simon was carrying it i'm i i don't know i i just always imagine in my head that somehow they were both holding the cross and simon was probably carrying the load is that making sense yeah i mean he was helping him uh, does it say though he, he i might said, be wrong i might be completely he wrong. said and they came out and found a man serene uh, of serene yeah that was simon just by name he they compelled to bear his cross and they i assume are the soldiers yeah. so um yeah and it doesn't really say what simon did beyond that one sentence no in matthew yeah um so tragic yeah i always wondered how much a cross weighed 75 to 100 pounds i mean that's how much i thought it would weigh no it was massive because it's got to hold the well. Wood can hold weight. Wood can hold weight. Um, I don't know. You're uh, right. Uh, I don't know. In the <laughs> in the movie, it looks like it weighs a bazillion pounds. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. If... Yeah. Yeah. Um. Cardo, Matthew 27, 34. They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. This time, and one more time in verse 48, he was given, Yeshua was given this drink, which he refused. Another reference in prophecy fulfilled, this one from Psalm 69, verses 20 and 21. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I'm full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Mm. Man. Mm. Yeah, okay, Gilda says an eight-year-old weighs 80 pounds across his way more. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be way different. It's got to be like 150 pounds. Yeah, I think so. 
Oh, that's brutal, man. That is brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Carter says, some say out there that there that it was not a cross, but a that the horizontal part called patibulum, a big piece of wood that they used back then to lock big doors sideways. Mm. And and that Romans had a tree prepared with a pint uh, on this piece of wood had a hole in the middle uh, in which the pre-prepared tree was inserted into. Hmm. Maybe. That's interesting. Because it does say hung on a tree a lot in the prophecies. Mary says, this is so hard to hear someone you love so deeply being tortured like this. Yeah. Yeah. It's never easy to talk about. Point. You had a point. Yeah, got you, Ricardo. Yeah, it's never easy to... Never easy, my friends. I hear you. <laughs> uh, Ricardo. Oh, go ahead. You read this one. Okay. Matthew 24, 46 through 47. And about the ninth hour, Yeshua cried out with a loud voice saying... Eli, Eli, Lama, Shabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man called for uh, Elijah. Uh, this I read many, many times and always wondered if Holy Ghost left Yeshua, but this point for a reason, left Yeshua by this point for a reason and had a few conjectures about it, but no one seemed right, but none seemed right. And thanks to Strong's concordance, I have the original language meaning cleared it up for a little bit for me and found out that Mark mentions the same situation but uses the word Eloi instead of the word Eli, as Matthew did. Both words seem to be in a different dialect, but both words have the same root origin. The word El, which indeed refers to God, the Almighty, makes sense that people standing there may misheard Yeshua and her thought he was saying Elijah. Oh, Elijah. Elijah. Yeah, it makes sense. Which name is the conjunction of the word El and Yah? Uh, that kind of surprised me is that people who heard him totally missed the reference, but that, but then I realized I missed it too. By this point, Yeshua was on a terrible pain. Uh, despite all the punishment he received before being crucified, beaten, mocked, there are many nerves in the wrist and upper part of the feet. The pain he must have been feeling had to be uh, had to had to be only bared. Bearable. I can't. The pain he must have been feeling had to be only bearable by his strength of the Holy Ghost. And For, the strength of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Mr. T. Oh, the, the strength of the Holy Ghost. Thanks. For even at this point, Yeshua here, as I read all this, feels like he was not complaining or felt forsaken, but actually quoting Psalm, a song that talked about him and this precise moment. I think that this was the reason for Matthew and Mark clarifying what was the interpretation of the sentence. I think they got the reference. Um, scroll for me. Oh, good. Uh, Yeshua at the cross and having excruciating pain, quoting scripture, Psalm 22. This feels like an answer to all who were standing there mocking him. And this is amazing, even more while reading Psalms 22, which says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Hear the word helping is H3444. Yeshua, I reread this sentence as, Why art thou so far from me, Yeshua, and from the words of my roaring, Woo, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, in the night season, and I am not silent, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our father trust in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried out unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confound. This so far feels like is talking about the prayer that took place in the garden before they came to take Yeshua, when he prayed for the Father's will to be done, but not his, because he trusts. But I am a worm, and no man a reproach of men, and despised of the people. The word worm in the original language means a maggot, as verocious, uh, specifically the crimson grub, but also only in this connection of the color from it and the color and the clothes dyed therewith. The crimson worm is color red, 
I am a worm and no man left to me felt felt to me as a direct reference to how much Yeshua must have been beaten or beaded and hurt, probably totally covered in blood, totally unrecognized uh unrecognizable and hurt. It made me cry. I also the word reproach means contum continually disgraced or contumely disgraced the pudenda. This felt like uh, I said before, made me think that Yeshua was felt full naked in front of everyone. So sad. Continued. Uh, all that all they that see me laughed me to scorn. They shout out the lip. They shake the head, saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him, delighted in him. This matches 100% with the mocking in the cross. When people say to Yeshua, if you are a Messiah, save yourself. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from my womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Total reference to Mary encounters with the angels and telling her what was hap what was going to happen. But not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Yeshua was alone in the cross. Many bulls have compa compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They ga gaped, gaped. Up, gaped upon me with, oh, to look, yeah. sorry. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a raving and roaring lion. This felt is a reference to the Roman soldiers who beat Yeshua. It continues. Warning. This is why... Way too sad. Okay, sorry. You want me there's, to... It's just that there's typos, so just so you know, and yeah, there's yeah. like a translation thing, guys. We, you know, nothing against you, Ricardo, but I don't want people thinking that every time I read Ricardo, I'm like trying to make fun of his writing or anything. Yeah, no. I, it's just hard because there's typos and there's a language translate thing that happens. So I'm not making fun of Ricardo. <laughs> Go no, ahead, yeah. dude. Go ahead. I was just going to give you a break because it's Thanks. a long one. <laughs> it continues. No, because I sound like I'm retarded. I no, gotta go ahead. It's yeah, fine. You know, it's man. fine. I'm not. Listen, <laughs> I am not too proud for my friend to help me with the reading. No, I okay. Just, it, here we is, go. This is a lot, and it's good, though. It is good. It continues. Warning, this is way too sad, but matches as perfect as Yeshua only can. I am poured out like water, totally bled out, and all my bones are out of joint by the weight of his own body hanging. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws from thirst, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet, so sad. Um, um, I may, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. In fact, Roman soldiers did that. Mm -hmm. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the wild bulls. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will praise thee. Oh, come on. Yet that ye that fear the Lord praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he had, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation, in the great congregation. Mm. I'm thinking, mm. you know what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord and s praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. This final sentence, this next final sentences are, Whoa! All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship, and they shall go down to the dust. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. Mm. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness 
unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Just amazing. So, which psalm was wow, this? that's awesome. 22. Psalm 22. Oh my huh? goodness huh? gracious. Come on! Be the what light. Day today? 22. Day it? 22, be the light. 22, be the light. Whoa! Look at that perfect read! Woo Ricardo, that is, that is actually super perfect. That is perfect, because perfect, yeah. Theoretically, we could have covered this last week even, right? We could have, and but, it would have been the 22nd. But it falls right then today. What a... You just... We love you. Yes. We love all of you, and we love you, Ricardo. Well done, well done, well done. That was fantastic. Very nice. That was so awesome. Yes. That was so awesome. That was so awesome. <laughs> wow. I mean, if that doesn't describe the millennial, I don't know what does, y'all. Just saying. It's all good, dude. No way. All right. Leo. Leo. It's like a fun name to say, right? It okay. Is a fun name. Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The word to quake in my French strong translation can mean figurative to shake the spirit. The same uh, notion appears in Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. The word shaken can also mean to shake the spirit. So the spirit is shaken in Yeshua's death and at his second coming. The arrival of the Holy Spirit can certainly be seen as a shaking of the spirit, and I rejoice to see what the shaking of the spirit will be at his return. Come on, me too! Oh yeah, I like what you're saying here. Um, it underlines also the plan of the Lord of Humanity, with different steps that humankind has to go through. When I see things like that, I feel like in the Lord's Wonderland. I feel like I, I'm like I'm in the world's Wonderland, Lord's Wonderland. On the other side, I was thinking about the notion that we are sheep uh, here. Use so use so that others can fulfill their sin. So through the crucifixion, Yeshua not only allowed for those who believe in Him to be saved by Him and to be blessed by the Holy Spirit, but also to fulfill the sin of the adversary. The adversary could kill the Lord, or thought so, which fulfills his sinly desire to get rid of God. I was only at the beginning of the understanding of this notion, even if I experienced it myself a lot and dreamed about it. It is a notion that is hard to grasp and to become totally aware of what it means because of the real consequence of it, like suffering and being used for that, like Yeshua was and is experienced. And as we are made in his image and supposed to become one with him, so it seems logical that we live that too in some way. Absolutely. In Luke 12, 51, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. It seems to me that the verse is related to that too. So humans can choose between being saved by him or to, to fulfill, whoa, 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 super zoom in, or to fulfill their sin. And all those who participate in the plan of the Lord will be used for that too. So, through his death, Yeshua accomplishes also two opposite things that seem to be non-separable on the earth and which happen simultaneously. One, the renewing of the spirit and the walk of each human and humanity on his way back to the Lord. And two, the separation from the sinner and the cleaning of humanity from sin and sinners. One wonderful, the other horrible. I was understanding this, and at the same time, it left me speechless. And yesterday, suddenly, Yeshua turned on the light in me, saying, This is the only way for evil to define itself entirely and actively by itself. Wow. That is the reprobate mind. Yes, very, very good. Yes. Very, very good. I like oh, these very are, good these comments. Are fabulous. See, you guys, amazing you comments. Guys leave you guys. Amazing comments. This is a great mean... conversation. This is great stuff. Yeah, really. You're like really genuinely. great deep stuff. Yeah, these are fantastic notes and comments well, you guys come up with. I just absolutely love it. You know, when, when you know, hold moments. On a second, hold on a Alex, I think you missed a video, buddy. You're, you're spamming. You're getting to the point of spamming. You're repeating the same thing over and over again. We've already addressed you. Maybe you missed it. Maybe you stepped out. But now it appears you're online. Send me an email here in the messenger, and we will talk to you about that. Uh, just make sure you come... Uh, with a little bit less uh, less ego, bud. Uh, we know we know you're the bomb.com in your own mind, and we welcome any type of conversation with people who have a humble heart. 
So uh, yeah, you missed it. And, and you're really making yourself look bad. Uh, and I don't want you to look bad. I don't want anybody here to ever see you in another chat and just think you're a troll. I believe that you might be coming at us with the right heart, but maybe you're just behaving in an inappropriate manner, which is very spammy. So write me. My name is Nathan Wheeler. I'm the owner of the page. Write me directly so that you're not spamming this conversation. Uh, as we open up with this video, this video is about Matthew 27 and no other conversations. You got it? I know you're not a troll. That's what I'm saying. I'm seeing your comment. I'm interacting with you. I already interacted with you, but you must have missed it. So write me directly and me and you will have a talk and we will set up the thing that you were talking about if it's appropriate. Okay, so welcome. Now you can stop leaving comments on this video about what you're commenting on. Thank you for your time. Okay, go ahead. Dude. All right. Did I handle that well? Yes. Okay, good. That was very good. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. So, gosh, I forgot what I was saying. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um. Oh, I was just gonna say that. Um. What what a what a awesome, amazing, beautiful thing it is that we get to experience as we go on this journey together, guys. As we read the whole thing, when you have moments like Yeshua turned on the light in me saying, yes, this is the only way for evil to define itself entirely and actively by itself. You know, those questions that nag us when we maybe are baby believers or not yet believers, mm. those questions that are that are just designed to stab a believer and go, yeah, well, if God is so good, why this bad thing and that bad thing? Oh, yeah, well, where's your God now? Get off the cross. So all of it, all of that, gets answered when you read the entire Bible. And Amen. it happens just like that. Yeshua turns on the light in you. Amen, exactly. It doesn't happen because I, can, I can't take that sentence and start pointing a specific scripture and go, just read this sentence in the Bible and you will understand. Yeah. No, because even if the sentence says something like that, you can't even digest it. That's not enough. Well, you have to have the Spirit giving understanding because otherwise, like you're saying, it's yeah. the words. Yeah, the, the the realization and the revelation is really what it is, right? You got yeah. a revelation, so that's awesome. Fine. Study to find thyself approved. approved. Yep. Real life comment here. Jennifer Connolly says the veil was four inches thick, the ripping of a phone book in half. For those of you who don't know about a phone book, it was this thing that we had a long time ago before the internet, <laughs> and like every single person who lived in the city and every single business in the city was all written in this really really big thick book I think a lot of our folks know no what that there's is. some people out there in the world who don't know what a phone book is okay it's very thick they don't very know what heavy. a thompson guide is either okay did you ever get a thompson guide oh yeah i used oh, one you know I, I actually used a tom thomas, so, yeah. thomas guide thomas guide yeah yeah thomas guide. what did i say thompson yeah, yeah. thomas guide yeah that was it. Th thomas guide yeah so yeah big thick book Super crazy. The thick. veil was four inches thick. That's crazy, huh? Phone book was. I uh, mean, <laughs> old as old technology. Wow. They used to put everybody's name and number. You could go to a city and look everybody up. Yeah, phone books are from the twentieth century. Phone book address and name. I guess we're like almost a quarter into the twenty first century. I know. Time is just what. Almost. A quarter. Are we in the future? We're only two years. Are we in the year future? and a half away? Are we talking on a magic we're mirror to future. people? Are yeah. we in the future? Yeah, we we're totally in the future. We're in the future. Okay, you read this one. All right, Jean uh, uh, Jean Conrad Lucier, uh, Matthew um, twenty seven fifty two through fifty three. I've been in church my whole life, but just now, reading the Bible all the way through in order, so much is missed when you don't read it for yourself. Like, how did I miss this? Tombs were opened and bodies of saints were raised. This reads so different when you train your mind to read the whole story without skipping anything. Come on. I've discovered one of the dangers of cherry picking the Bible. It trains your mind to subconsciously gloss over parts of it. I've read Matthew many times throughout my life and how I completely miss dead people coming to life concerns me. <laughs> my mind typically concentrates on the traditional parts that are taught about in church. The Old Testament was filled with so much cool stuff, too, that I never knew about. Mm. If only people knew how cool the Bible is. Ah! Gina, I, I, I actually like the part that it concerned you. Because <laughs> it concerned me when I read it. And I was like, and as you guys know, my time, I'm like, who do I talk to about what I just read in this book? Because all the people who say they follow it, like, never talk about this part. Yeah. And it concerned me. Concerned me like, what? 
where was I? I know you're saying because you had studied before, but through the church thing, and then you read it your whole through straight through, and you're like, wait, wait, what? What did it just say? <laughs> Has this been in here the whole time? And it's just great. I love the concern part because there is like this. It's so awakening. Yeah. It's so like mind blowing that you're like, I'm concerned that I've never noticed this part or heard this part or talked about this part before. Yeah. yeah I love that. And um, Mary responds and says. Uh, I've read the Bible many times throughout my life, but every time I read it yet again, it's like I'm reading something new that I've never read before. Amen. Some new detail pops out at me and that, that I never noticed before, or I get some new revelation through reading it again. It's mm. like a magical book that keeps telling new stories all the time. It's the most unusual book ever. Come on. Amen. That is true. That um, is true. And John says, I can't wait to read the Bible a second Jean? time. Gene is a Gene. I'm uh, sorry. I'm feeling very French today. I can't wait to read the Bible a second time. I feel like it'll be all new again. You're here. Same with you. I'm with you on that. Sarah Peterson says, I can so relate to this. I miss so much reading the Bible out of order and the reading it and reading it in order for the second time. I'm finding a bunch of new things again. The word is so alive. It's truly Come amazing. On. And Dina says, I know what you mean. I remember once hearing Nathan talking about the dead saints coming back to life. And I was like, what? <laughs> I had to go back and read it again. And Gene says, or I'm sorry, Jim Hogg says, Amen. Yeah. And so do we. So do I. We say Amen. Amen. Cameron, uh, Matthew 27, 52 through 53. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Yeah, this is mind blowing that people like don't know this. This is actually a thing. I mean, a lot of people don't know. It's so awesome though. So this passage is what struck out stuck out to me the most. I can read you guys, I promise. So this passage is what stuck out the most to me when reading Matthew 27. This made me think of how Yeshua ministered to people who had died before he came. It really reinforced the idea that Yeshua died for everyone, not just those who would believe, as John macarthur so i yeah i'm gonna say his name john macarthur so i idiotically puts it <sighs> okay i'm liking this comment too much cameron i'm holding it in inside i can't even tell you okay it led me to th it led me thinking about the end and redemption for those who lived before yeshua's time and those who didn't have the chance to accept him maybe during the thousand years question mark Regardless of this scripture brought me to think of the beauty of what God has done and that he truly is king of everything. So consistent with the rest of the Bible, very important key part, and however the end occurs, I'm sure it will be a fitting one. Hallelujah. Amen. That's right. That's right. This is so good. So good. So good. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh, okay. Deborah Lives says, yes, I love to read it continuously. Then I can remember where to revert back to you in the Old Testament, the prophecies about the New Testament. Vicky says, it's like the show, The Magical School Bus. Every time they get on the bus, they went on a new adventure. <laughs> it's true. Gilda, the Bible is pretty awesome. And by that, I mean the best <laughs> thing ever. <laughs> yep. Yep. True, um, true statement. Ricardo. Uh... 2752. 2752 and the graves were open and many bodies of the saints were slept which slept arose like i said before this chapter is full of prophecies fulfilled this is what isaiah 26 verse 19 says the dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they rise awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust for thy dew is the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead there's just so much happening right now. I just am like biting the tongue because I can't wait to get in more. That's so awesome. Mm. So explosions yeah. of like excitement. I mean, it definitely sounds like the prophets rose and got to meet Messiah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, right I, I, pick, and there I pick up Jerusalem. what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Ricardo, uh, go ahead. Matthew 27, 57, 60. Uh, when the eve was come, there came a rich man, uh, Arme Arimathias, named Joseph, was also himself was a Yeshua disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Yeshua. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewed out in the rock. And he rolled out a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. 
Another prophecy fulfilled again, Isaiah 53, verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yes. Mono, um, the tearing of the veil in the temple shows our inclusion in Christ. What separated us from God has been broken. Mm -hmm. When we think of a veil, we may think of a thin cloth, but the veil of the temple was thick to the point that a man could not break it with his hands. The veil was what guarded the Holy of Holies. The priests could only enter at certain times, and they had to enter with a rope around their waist and bells attached to their clothes, because if they were in sin, they would die, and the only way to get them out was by pulling the rope. <laughs> the rendering... That's how the real it was. The rending of the veil had two implications. We can now access the Holy of Holies, but it also showed the hypocrisy and emptiness of the Jewish religion as the Ark was not there. I understand that the record of Matthew 27.52 regarding the resurrection was not about the physical world. This is due to Matthew calling the city holy. The holy Jerusalem is not the earthly one, even though this is a written word of God on earth but the heavenly Jerusalem that will appear in the writings of the revelations. Hmm. I understand that the resurrection cited by Matthew is that our spirits who were resurrected and are in the holy city with the Lord Yeshua. Um, as Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, but God being rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when, he, when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for grace have ye been saved, and raised us up with him, and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Matthew 27, 62-66 shows that the whole Bible reveals, shows what the whole Bible reveals. Miracles do not produce faith, mm. given that even though all this happened, when the Lord died, and, and it was revealed that they crucified the Son of God, they continued in rebellion when asking Pilate to guard Yeshua's tomb. This shows the dissatisfaction, impossibility, and blindness of religion. Um, the religious atheist is satisfied in his unwillingness to seek the one who is truth. Hmm. What mm. you're thinking? I like it. <laughs> um. Yeah, I I think, I I think that uh, so I think what what I'm picking up here, what you're actually pointing out, Mono, is really interesting, in light of what we just talked about about how they're they're mixed, sort of attitudes. Um. Well. As far as Caiaphas is concerned, if he's truly a Sadducee, then he doesn't believe that Yeshua is Messiah. There is no Messiah. Right. And he only believes that, yeah, in fact, what they're probably going to do is, uh, you know, try to steal his body and claim he was resurrected. Um, so put guards up and don't let him do it. We need to stop, you know, we need to stop the religious stuff or the, the, the you know, the, the crazy the, zany the crazy people. fairy tale stuff. We yeah. got to get this thing under control. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know the earthquake, the the what you call it ripping of the veil. The, well, the ripping of the veil and the um the eclipse and the eclipse. Oh yeah. Um. So all of those things happening, you would think could possibly make Caiaphas wonder if in fact he was the Messiah. He was the Messiah, but then Caiaphas is already convinced he couldn't be the Messiah because he died. So now he could only be somebody whose body was stolen from the tomb mm -hmm. and then his disciples are going to claim he's resurrected so mm -hmm. like he's already caiaphas has already proved this guy's not the messiah that's the way caiaphas sees it so mm -hmm. regardless of what happened to the veil and all of that stuff he doesn't he can't follow the <laughs> he can't follow it at this point you know what i mean yep <laughs> um plus um if in fact he is resurrected and there were guards at the tomb and yet he's not in there and the tomb was never opened or whatever, he's not there anymore, then then that's actually more proof that what he was telling is the truth, that he did rise from the dead. Mm -hmm. um, 
But yeah, about the... If there's any more comments? Go ahead, read there, it. There is one more, but it's not about okay. the go. resurrection. Let's say, go for it. Well, I wanted to get your opinion, because I think what Mono is saying, the way it strikes him is interesting, you know, that the that the saints rose up not in Jerusalem, but in the holy Jerusalem, and that they rose up seeing Christ now in, you know, the heavenly realm or whatever. Hmm. I think that's an interesting... Uh, it's interesting because... Uh, I mean, I can also imagine how... You know why is that why is that here in this part of the story well because even if it was in the heavenly realm for the for the prophets and the saints their story has ended they are in fact here in front of messiah meaning mm -hmm. i don't mean it's ended but i'm like they're they have received the one they were waiting for mm -hmm. and so by them receiving the one they were waiting for it doesn't matter whether it happened whether they rose in the flesh on earth or they rose you know, in 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 perfection in have in the holy city, as you say, in the heavenly one. Um, uh, either way, it's it's a great uh, end for the saints that came before. So, but anyway, that's that's really all I was going to say is that I think that's an interesting. I think I I, I think it's an interesting point of view, Mano. Hmm. Yeah, it was a very interesting take. Yeah. Thank you for sharing it. I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Peterson, verse 62. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. I had not noticed this before, but the day after preparation day, which is apparently the day before the Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees went before Pilate. That means they went to Pilate on the Sabbath. Wouldn't that not be allowed for them to go to Pilate on Sabbath? No. They're allowed to walk around on Sabbath. I don't know. I don't perceive that that's against the law on Sabbath. They just can't labor and do things that for their preparation. But I don't know. That's a very good question. I, I have to actually look into that before I say that I don't know that they're not. I'm just because I'm commenting right now, which I shouldn't do uh, on this particular thing. So I'm going to continue to read. My bad. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. That would be considered work. Yeah, I see your argument. I don't think it's that kind of work, though, if I'm remembering Sabbath work law, okay? Because a priest did work on Sabbath, by the way. I find it interesting. They had to priest stuff. They had to do priestly things. Because like, that's when they did all the priestly stuff. Right. <laughs> so the, the priest did work on Sabbath. That was what, what made them kind of different. Wouldn't that not be uh, allowed for them to go before Pilate on Sabbath? That would be considered work. I find it interesting that they all decided to work on the Sabbath after being so mad at Yeshua for healing on the Sabbath. It seems that it was such a concern to them to cover up the fact that they murdered on innocent man, or murdered an innocent man and make everyone forget about Yeshua. That they were blatantly breaking the law in a way that they must have known was wrong. So I'm glad I commented, I guess. I'm sorry, because yeah, they weren't actually breaking the law uh, at that time. They weren't. They, they were allowed to do that. It makes me think about how easy it is for jealousy and obsession to build up in someone's serious mistake. The chief priests and Pharisees decide that they didn't want to accept Yeshua as Messiah. And we are so obsessed with trying to find him doing something wrong, but never could. They were still so jealous of him that they resorted to breaking the law several times in this chapter in order to get rid of him. They did do that. I know we were talking a lot last week uh, about having compassion on Judas, how he could be like any of us. But also, I think in the case of the Pharisees, it's easy to see ourselves. They are so utterly convinced that their interpretation of scriptures are correct, that they are so jealous at the attention Yeshua was getting. Uh, that they resorted to breaking the law to try and get rid of him. Yes, I, I agree with that statement 100%. I can totally perceive how humans, Christians in fact especially, can be very much like the Pharisees. Uh, how easy it is once we have a lot of knowledge, ideas, doctrines being put down others around us when they say anything different or take attention away from ourselves it is very convicting for me because I often struggle now with having unity with and compassion for other believers that I see around me who are very religious but haven't read the Bible all the way through a hold to be, or hold to beliefs and practices that I believe are unbiblical. It can so easily turn into sin upon sin upon sin, just like the Pharisees. So exactly what I hate I become if I give in to hating 
on these people or arguing with them. Wow. Perfect last comment to this Absolutely. chapter. Absolutely. Well done. There's one more. Oh, there's comment. one more. Well, it's still a but great finishing that's a one. Great comment. Yeah, that was um, really, really good. Beautifully said. You know, as we as we accuse and and judge the Pharisees, the Sadducees, oh. the Judasesees, and all of the seas <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah. come against Yeshua. Yeah. Um uh if if we don't see <laughs> how easily we ourselves can be part of that sea in a heartbeat mm -hmm. and how quickly we can justify the the all the nasty stuff with rationale that we just did here we were got into the mind of the priesthood we got into the mind of 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 the pharisees of the sadducees of the day and we can all see how confused they were mm -hmm. which is why yeshua does probably say forgive them lord they know not what they do uh forgive me father so anyway, my point basically is, is man, the moment you think you know better than someone else, it's a good idea to check, check in, uh, and make sure that in fact, you know, our Pharisee isn't showing, right? <laughs> and I laughed earlier when, when I think it was you that used the word, you know, persuaded. Uh, I, I know I can speak quite boldly in my opinions or my persuasions, but I do also hope that, you know, when I speak, I, I, it is also clear that I'm open to being uh, taught still, right? Still yeah. learning a thing or two, right? And, uh, and you know, I, I believe I say almost every video when somebody brings, oh, that's awesome. I didn't know that. Or, oh, that was cool. Or, that was such a great thing to bring up. Or, wow, glad you found that. Like, yeah. these are me being excited as anybody else would be excited, right? And I, I don't mean to make it about me even in the sentence. But what I'm saying is, is that, like, you know, even in the position where this is, like, the ministry that I've been given, I still, I, I hope that the, one of the examples that this ministry sets is, is, one, how EBRT is formatted. We all come together and talk rather than two people talk and share what they learned, right? And, and that's a really great thing is using words like persuaded, I am convinced of, it leaves in dialogue with people the opportunity to say to the person, I might be wrong. Uh, I, there, this, there, may not, there may be a piece I have not yet come across. Yeah. And so I know I sound probably like it's almost comical, like a Saturday Night Live skit, how much I abuse the word persuaded, but it fits so perfectly because it is exactly what I mean. Up to the point of my knowledge, up to this day in this moment, this is what I am convinced of. Instead of all that sentence, I just go, I'm persuaded. So it just it just sums it, and Paul used it. So I just love it for all the reasons <laughs> above, right? So, it, you know, really just, I, I'm glad you, you commented it beautifully said, and uh, I think that, it, though it may seem silly incorporating verbiage like that, not just here at Yeshua Network, but when we incorporate verbiage like that into our dialogue, it does disarm people in in conversation, I feel. That's all. Yeah, that's good. And allows for the opportunity for all of us to grow and learn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, final comment here in the prepared comments, Mary. Um, uh, general comment, Christ is an example for us in every way, and that means enduring hardship, persecution, and our own daily crosses, but all this is for our good. You know... <clears throat> oh, oh, my disc ran out of space. Oh, that's all right. Um, he knows... Um, mm, he knows the patient endurance that he needs to work in us to build our character so that we grow deep roots and will not be like the seed that was planted, which only lasts for a short time. Mm. Mark 4, 17, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Here's another passage that equates hardship as a form of dis discipline, and hardship can take many forms. Hebrews 12, 1 through 7, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with pers perseverance yes. the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on yeshua the pioneer and the perfecter perfecter of faith for the joy set before him he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of god 
Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Mm. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses a son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the, Lord's, because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. <laughs> Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. Amen, amen, amen. 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 Um, Nathan is asking, do you think that over time the Pharisees were believers of the word with great zeal, but over time they transformed into a Judas in a way? They worship money and power, just a thought. Um, not all of them. Not every single one that identified as a Pharisee. There were some that Yeshua met along the way, we'll read about it perhaps in other Gospels, that uh, became believers, that became followers of Yeshua. Mm -hmm. Um uh, so Pharisee is not, you know, we, we, it doesn't you know, mean what the Christians have made yeah, it mean. Yeah. It's been made to mean like, you know, hypocrite, bad believer, evil, bad leader, bad leader. Right. Um, it actually means a Jew who believes in Messiah. <laughs> yeah. So it's actually, if you were a messianic Jew, you'd be fair. You'd be a Pharisee in that time. I don't think well, they call it them. They call they, do, do they use that word still? Probably not. I don't know if they do, but no, no, the point, I know that's not, you're, you're not asking whether you, you understand what Pharisee meant. You're just saying also like it. And you're not saying all of them. Yeah. Did. Yeah. Not all of them necessarily did, but some probably may have. And, and the Sadducees were a very strong movement and the Sadducees were, I would guess, were probably much more favorable to Rome or rather the Romans like the Sadducees a lot more. And um, I, if I remember correctly, those particular set of high priests they had in the temple, Caiaphas and then the one before him, um, they were appointed by uh, King Herod, who wasn't a real king, who was also kind of appointed by the Roman governor. Right. So Not by God. Not by God. So it wasn't, the king wasn't in the line of David, so right. therefore he's not a real king. Yep. Uh, the priests may or may not have been even Levites, or if they were Levites, they weren't probably in the line of Aaron. Aaron. So they weren't actually real high priests. Well, we don't know that. But we it's don't saying know. that there's the possibility because it was appointed by a more of a Gentile-leaning, yeah. appointed Roman king of the area. Yeah. So it's it's just the whole thing is corrupt. It is. So so that's what my brother's trying to say. If exactly. I'm Thank so. you. Yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, yeah. Are you, continue. I don't want to... Um, oh, well, that's what I'm saying is like, you know... Uh, Probably the the most real Pharisees of the Pharisees of the day were probably people who became followers of Yeshua. Yeah. Um, exactly. So, really, they get a bad rap. <laughs> yeah. The and on that note, I just wanted to say too because I love that comment, Nathan, and I think a lot of people, I think a lot of Christians, especially the way they use Pharisee in the church, or you're you're like you're a Pharisee. I mean, it's literally almost used like a four letter curse word, a Christian against Christian. Like, it's really interesting to see it used. And it's totally out of context of how it was meant to be. But yeah. I understand why they're, how they're using it. Yeah. But the um, the other thing I wanted to say, too, is the ones who behaved this way were more of the leadership. And I also just want to say, and, you know, this is not me defending these guys, okay? But it's more like just wanting to explain. Uh, it's more like I just want to explain the culture. The Jews were they 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 express, and we understand from history and from other scrolls and even from what we hear the 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 rabbis say in the Bible here that they were scared they were going to lose their culture, they were scared they were going to lose their their God. Um, they had already basically lost his involvement in the temple. Uh, and the other thing was is that you know they weren't even the people weren't even trained in Hebrew. They were speaking Aramaic, which was a Babylonian descending uh, global kind of Persian Assyrian. Assyrian thank yeah. you, that was the one. Assyrian 
uh, language, right? So they're not even speaking their own language anymore. Jews are running around in Jerusalem speaking Aramaic, and they're losing their culture. And all, all I'm saying is, is once again, people, when they're pinned in a corner, you know, they can become almost animalistic, right? Like when they feel they have no way out, there, there's it's fight or flight. Well, if you don't have the ability to flight, you only have one thing left in you, and that's to fight. And unfortunately, I think we're seeing it in the world now, you know, leadership of the world have pinned us in corners and we are fighting amongst ourselves over things we should probably not be fighting about and being so focused on. And I'm only bringing this up not to get political on this video, but to say, when you see how these people were so legalistic, we learned and we've kind of, I don't want to get away from it because it's taken us a year to read Matthew here. But if you remember... When they got the second temple, they were so terrified of breaking God's laws again and losing the temple again that they became like, they revamped the faith. They got the book out. They killed everybody who was trying to teach any type of philosophy or idea that went against the Bible, what their version of the Bible was, the Torah, the laws, and they had to clean house. And they would have been seen as absolute religious tyrants, and they would have been seen as absolutely legalistic crazy nuts and all this stuff. And they had all these holidays and practices and temples they wanted to go to that were all for the glory of God. But somebody had to come in and like legitimately clean house. That energy was what stayed with this religious group like as best as it could they had to protect what parts they could and as we hear from the priest in the bible they basically they're kind of doing very political things well it's better that this guy even though he's going around healing even though he's going around teaching the truth of the bible we find actually no wrong in what he's saying but we find danger in what he's saying and it challenges us who are the protectors of the faith Right. And if he removes us, how is he one guy, if he's not Messiah bin David, going to protect the entire exactly. faith from everybody he else? He can only stir the pot the way he's stirring the pot if he's Messiah, because if he's not Messiah, he's going to kill us all. Exactly. That's what they're thinking. Exactly what they're thinking. And so that's that's the mentality here that I feel is super important to talk about is like we have to understand that these people. I don't perceive that when they came to Yeshua and they had like Nicodemus, when they came to Yeshua, he wasn't coming at him like a jerk. He was coming at him like, man, you are meddling with the most dangerous part of Judaism. You are claiming to be the most dangerous claim in all of Judaism. And your teachings are confusing the daylights out of us. But we can't say no to the miracles. We can't say that the miracles you've done haven't happened. And we can't say no to the way that you're affecting the people. We are conflicted. Help us, right? Like this is a dialogue in the Bible between a Pharisee and Yeshua. And I have a feeling that that Pharisee represents more of the, of the uneducated normal folk than you, you get what I'm trying to say. I love, I love what you're saying right now, man. It's absolutely awesome. And that we're ending this video on this note. I think it's super, super important. Because for as much as um, the Jews deny Christ, twice, three times more, the Christians deny the Jews. Exactly. In the way that we are all perceiving our one and only God. You know what I mean? And we deny the Old Testament. And we deny the Old Testament. And our our you know the the christian sort of it's okay to do that because look what they did to this look what they did to yeshua look what they did to jesus it's okay for us to say you know you guys have to repent a lot yeah and um and and they on the other hand look and go well you you have like a pantheon and you do you color eggs and do trees and things that were like you know from babylonian like weird religions that sacrifice people and you and you, you, you don't, you don't show us the the where are the fruits of your holiness? The the most Christian nation, some of the most Christian nations on earth have some of the most unholy things happening inside them. Mm -hmm. Where are the fruits of your holiness? Right. You know. So like this is where we are. This is the divide. Mm. Um. So I just I love what you're saying. I love what you're bringing up. I love what you're the the picture you are. And you're not Jewish by birth. Mm. I am. Right. <laughs> I have a lot more uh I, I would have a lot more pride in this to go, yeah, that's right. The Jews did not do so wrong. But to be completely honest with you, 
that's not how I've been feeling reading this. I've been feeling reading this kind of like, man, those Pharisees, man, somebody needs to slap them, you know? And, and, and my brother here is like reminding me that, yeah, the, they, you know, if you, if you consider the history of their walk, you know, if you consider they're under the thumb of the Roman empire, the most long lived, most powerful empire to this day. Yeah. There has not been an empire stronger, more fearsome, and more just giant than Rome. I mean, you know. Well, if, and if let you... me interrupt you real quick. Not only are they in that, but they had just come out of the closest annihilation to the entire race of people. Yeah. Where there was only 10 or 20,000 of them left. Yeah. Out of 3.5 million that came over from Egypt. Like, that's super scary numbers. Right. Right. Like if you thought to yourself that only 10,000 of your millions of brothers and sisters around the world that shared your blood back to your grandfather, like Abraham, had almost got completely eradicated. That's like the other thing about Jews that, you know, has definitely come into the forefront in the last hundred years, of course. But like, it's just I, I'm throwing that in because that's a very real thing for them. Then it was 400 years back then was fresh. It's not like today where 400 years was a totally different universe. Right back yeah. then, four hundred years was the same universe. Right, and they had the trees, and they had the same housing, and they had the same roads, and they had the same. The the the, the donkey they're riding came from the donkey that was four hundred years ago. Like right. there was very clear that their world was directly attached to the people that came out of Babylon. Right, so it's like, and 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 they got the second temple. So I'm 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 throwing that in because now they're not just under Rome. But they had also just nearly escaped annihilation. Right. So, like, you know, there's this whole syndrome, if you will, that incorporated especially those who were given the position to protect that, which in all reality was super fragile. And Rome proved that at any moment, if they wanted to, they could have eradicated the Jews. Luckily enough, the Rome's whole ideal of the world was let every culture be every culture, but embrace every culture. That saved them. You get what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah. if it wasn't that, like, there would be no Jew. There would be no Rome. Like, there or Jerusalem. There'd be nothing. Be and the Rome, and, and Titus proved that. We, 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 we could annihilate you so easily. Watch this. We're going to do it to the point where it's a dark mockery of you. You, you get what I'm saying, too? So right. it, this mindset is like, you, you know, I, I know I'm ranting. I cut you off, but continue. So no, just just coming from that part where there was only 10 to 20,000 of them yeah, left. Right. That's a super scary number. Yeah. And, and you know, and that, that isn't to say that everything they did, obviously, in the, in, in the stories we've just read are justified. justified, excusable, good, okay, should be. No, we're not, you know, nobody's saying that. Um, did they... Did they sin in the temple? Yes. Yeah. Did they turn the the his father's house into a into a market into a money changer's house? Yes, they did that. Yeah. Um, was that worthy of being yelled at? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um. Uh. You know, does Yeshua have the right to judge them? Yes. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Always. Do Do I? No. No. <laughs> do I? No. Does anybody else? No. <laughs> you know yeah and, um, and i think that is the message of really what i was trying yeah. to say here at the end was just as we read this part and as we take a look at these people you know yeah. from the confusion of how are they laying down the palm leaves to two days later chanting crucify him to being pharisaical and even beating him and doing this to him like it was their messiah they should have known above anybody else there's so much more to this yeah that i really think is not in the conversation of christians Right. And it breaks my personal heart because yeah. I, I think, too, that if we don't know history, we'll repeat it. Yeah. Right. And and I think we're well, I think we're getting to the point where we're, we are repeating the, the Pharisee story. You know, we're getting to the point where we have a, a the wrong, biblically wrong idea of who you, Jesus Christ is. It has confused us. Our practices, our faith, our religious practices, our understanding, our use of the word Pharisee, <laughs> like everything is twisted and turned and we wouldn't dare. I don't believe there's a Christian alive that would say, you know, well, it's my fault then. They're going to say, well, it's not my fault. I was born into this. I was raised in this. I was trained in this. Okay. 
well, where did that history come from? What did those circumstances stem to? Why did it get twisted and turned all these years? Murder, death, corruption, you know, false religion, false spirits, all the above. Well, did the not the same thing happen to these people in this day? So once again, as I think it was Jennifer Connelly said in this video, you know, or maybe somebody else, so forgive me if it was somebody else, maybe Leo, somebody said, you know, we, I perceive that we could be a lot like the Pharisees. You know, like I not only can we relate to Judas, but we could also relate to the Pharisees if we really think about it. And I'm in 100% agreement. And I and I just, I, I'm soapboxing again, man, I apologize, but it's just, it's such an important note that for sure, as we finish Matthew here, we have one more chapter, but as we finish Matthew here, it is heavy, at least on my heart, that we do not finish this with the spirit of what is modern day Christianity. And that is to have this idea of the Pharisees and the people as these just like flip-flopping, emotional, psychological, crazy, let's kill the Messiah. Well, we don't think he's Messiah, but we'll take his fish bread and let him heal us. Like, I just think that that is a horrible demonized virgin, version of the people that lived and were there that day. And I think that that demonizing allows us to distance ourselves from the reality of the humans that were there that day. And it allows us to not actually learn from who they were and why they were. And that leads us to the potential of reliving those same sins. Super, super great. That's a super great conversation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, man. Absolutely love it. Um, real quick, last couple of comments and then we got to roll. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer says, very eye-opening and thought-provoking comments tonight. Lots to study. I knew it would be a good intersection with EBRT and Be the Light <laughs> on the same night. Psalms 22 bonus too. Thank yeah. you all. Have a blessed week. Happy Be the Light. That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, Bob says, the way I see it, variations of religion and denominations is the result of trying to mix obvious spiritual truth and human reasoning and have it make sense, yeah. which never actually happens. We must let go of our human perspective and totally embrace the love of God in order to see the full explanation of Scripture. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Totally right. Absolutely agree with you. Um, and, and that's exactly why I, I often say in this ministry I've had, what you're convicted about, you cannot force the conviction on other people it has to be something that the lord convicts us and we can inspire but we cannot legalistically place conviction on another person that that to me is where we move into the pharisaical sadducee temple leadership of of the time we move into that sin when we do that and because the bible because the veil has been ripped i love it uh we have each of us has the promise that those of us who seek the lord will find him those of us who open the door of our hearts, he will enter and the Holy Spirit will indeed be our counselor, not another human being, but the one that actually gives us understanding is the Holy Spirit. It is not the mind or the verbal experience or prowess of a human being. It is the Holy Spirit, like we also talked about with the with the vernacular that was used earlier. The light bulb went on and there's no way you can make that light bulb go on with somebody, even if they read the exact same sentence. Right. So sorry, just like you nailed it with the way you described it. And that's why I always say you can be convicted and that is good. And you must follow those convictions. But that doesn't mean that you force those convictions on other people. It's just legal. Like even biblically, that's not how it works, because every person arrives to God from a different place at a different time, at a different speed and a different, you know, uh, conviction uh, combination, if you will. Every person is a fingerprint. We're all completely different. It's, it's amazing. Soapbox. Sorry. Go. No, it's awesome. Finish us up. No, that's it. Bring us out. We love you guys so much. Yes. Thank you so much for your comments. And for all the new folks that joined us for the first time, thank you so much for joining. We hope that you're getting the sense of how powerful this series has been for all of us. Um, and um, uh, it, and we just, I just, no more talking. Love you. See you next week. Be blessed. And be the blessing. Always. Happy be the light.